Here. Representative Schwartz. Here. Representative Summers. Here. Representative Walters. Excused. Senator Agar. Excused. Senator Garou. Here. Senator Hicks. Here. Senator Kinski. He was just here, excused. He's here. Here, sorry, I was muted. Co-Chairman Nicholas. Here. Chairman Bebel. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Governor, uh, Representative Walters just joined us. Um, Representative Walters, good morning. Good morning, Walters is here. Okay, well, we have a, a full day ahead of us and although we may not have any updates from the governor on the proposed 10% or the 10% reductions, we'll, we'll get the information that we do have and, and a lot of the good information today. Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, do you have any comments? Nope. Any members of the Joint Appropriations Committee, anybody have any comments? It's good to see you again, Mr. Chairman. Good to be seen. Uh, actually, I'm at 8,600 feet up on Union Pass. It's amazing what technology does. Looks like I'm in Cheyenne. All righty, no comments. Let's get started. The first thing on our agenda is Don Richard with a, a update. Don, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Don Richards. I'm the LSO Budget Fiscal Administrator, and for this presentation, serving as the co-chairman of the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group. On July 29th, we prepared a revenue update. This is not a change to the Craig forecast, which was released on May 26, but rather a explanation of the actual revenues received to date uh, for the state of Wyoming. Uh, by way of introduction, let me step back to the May Craig update. And you'll recall at that time, Craig revised downward revenues by approximately $1.5 billion in total, $1.1 billion on the general fund budget reserve account, and about $400 million on the school foundation program school capital construction account. That $1.5 billion is really not the budget gap or the deficit, that is the amount of revenue that was reduced in the Craig May 2020 report. The budget gap are slightly different numbers because as you will recall, you left town in March with money on the table, unappropriated funds in the general funds. And on the school side, you actually left town with a budget gap. You'll recall you required about $200 million of LSRA to support K-12 operations for this biennium. So in terms of the budget gap from May, the amount is approximately $877 million in the general fund side, and that assumes full use of the statutory reserve amount, or that amount of approximately $100 million of cash that historically um, the legislature has retained in the budget reserve account and by statute, the governor is required to retain in the budget reserve account. On the school foundation program, school CAPCON side, uh, the total shortfall is approximately $541 million, which is comprised of a $26 million shortfall for capital construction and a $515 million on the operations side supported by the school foundation program. I provide that background just to give you a sense of, of where we were at the beginning of the summer. In the July revenue update, um, conditions improved, particularly for fiscal year 2020. Uh, specifically, the general fund improved by approximately $117 million. The LSRA improved by $50 million. The SIPA is unchanged. The reason that the SIPA is unchanged, as you'll recall, its primary revenue source is guaranteed 1.25% investment income from the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund. Since it's a guarantee, the actual revenues will meet the expectations and there was no change. On the school capital construction side, we improved by about $3 million, primarily due to state royalties. And on the school foundation program, we improved by about $24 million. One quick takeaway from that, you will see that the general fund side improved much more than the school side. 
the reason for that, number one, the school side does not benefit from sales and use taxes. And we uh, were uh, underestimated the strength of sales and use taxes um, this spring and summer. And then secondly, uh, school revenue is largely lagged. So um, it does not uh, ha pick up many benefits from any of the extractive industries or very little benefits from FMRs in the extractive industries uh, compared to the severance taxes and FMRs on the general fund budget reserve side. So uh, stepping back rather than an $877 million um, shortfall, if you uh, add back the 117 million improvement on the general fund side, now you're looking at about $760 million. And we'll go through now briefly why uh, the Craig has underestimated it. You'll recall the theme of the um, May report, at least in my words, is humility. Um, we had one data point in May. We did not know how the federal programs would roll out. We would, did not know the economic reaction or duration of the coronavirus, not only in Wyoming, but uh, in other states whether shutdowns would reduce the demand for Wyoming's energy products, would reduce the demand for travel, would reduce the demand for tourism. Um, and we were uh, perhaps uh, overly uh, conservative. Uh, we, we missed the minerals uh, production, but I would argue at this time anyway, it looks like we missed it in terms of timing, not in terms of a computational error, not in terms of uh, the depth of the recession, as you know, there are no rigs operating, um, but we, we probably missed it by a few weeks in terms of how quickly um, the extractive industries would shut down. So um, we probably will end up with fiscal year 2020 uh, missing, that by, missing the extractive revenues by about one twelfth. And I would argue that the reason for that is we started the aggressive shutdown in March, and we really should have waited until April for the aggressive shutdown of the extractive industries. I am unconvinced, although Craig will certainly meet in September and again in October, uh, but speaking personally, I am unconvinced today that the Craig forecast for the extractive industries in terms of the decline, the slope of the decline, the duration of the curve is materially in error. For example, our coal production is right on target. Our coal prices are right on target. Our oil price is slightly hot, or excuse me, slightly low. Oil is slightly outperforming this summer compared to what we thought it would be. Um, it's about $42 today, maybe about $35 Wyoming oil. And we had anticipated something closer to the $30 range. So we might have a little bit of upside in oil price. In ga natural gas, um, again, we are very close to, to the estimate, both in terms of volumes produced as well as price. But I would notice that there are some initial, uh, initial um, positive notes. And really these are in the last three trading days. In fact, in the last three trading days, the summer heat from Southwestern United States, Arizona and California in particular, is the first time since December 17th of 2019 that both Opal and Cheyenne Hub trading natural gas on the western side of the state and the eastern side of the state have exceeded $2 per MCF. That is an extraordinary period of time and includes several winter months where Wyoming gas was trading below $2 per MCF. It was just last Friday, largely due to the heat wave in the Southwest, that both of those trading hubs exceeded um, uh, $2 for the first time. So there's modest optimism. $2 is nothing, uh, as, as those of you who are in the um, natural gas business know, that, that is not a great price, but it sure beats $1.50. Um, also, to, uh, to quote an industry representative who appeared before another committee of the legislature in the past month, it will take some time, given the fact, uh, for the extractive industries to rebound even after prices return uh, to a reasonable level. Uh, the decline in production is real. Uh, we have had um, uh, shutdowns uh, of operations. Um, we also have a natural declining production and it will take some time before uh, the prices are sufficiently strong to 
encourage or incentivize uh, rigs returning to the state. There are some rumblings, even as, as recently as last night, uh, of talks anyway, this is rumor, of uh, a rig or two returning to the state of Wyoming to uh, uh, re-engage in the production of Wyoming's uh, uh, natural gas. In terms of investment income, uh, the rate of return on the PMTF in terms of yield, not actual return because uh, unrealized capital gains do not uh, count in terms of revenue available for appropriation, but in terms of yield, which includes interest, dividends, and realized capital gains, um, on the PMTF, uh, we ended the year about 3.2%. On the common school account, we ended the year about 3.4%. Both of those were well under the spending policy amount of, uh, well under the spending policy amount of 5%. We also generated, um, or the state treasurer's office generated unanticipated capital gains from the state agency pool, meaning they sold some of their fixed income assets during this uh, low interest rate environment and that generated some capital gains that Craig had not anticipated, uh, a little bit more than $10 million. On the sales and use tax side, uh, the experiences here across the state uh, reflect remarkable differences. It, it is something um, I personally have not uh, experienced in my time working for the state, but the uh, Growth and decline by county and even by month uh, varies extremely widely. I've talked about this before where Sublet County is down 63% year over year in terms of their sales and use taxes for uh, collections in the month of July. Campbell County for those same months is down 33%. Teton County down 28%. So you see the large uh, tourism counties and extractive industry counties are really um, absorbing some, some difficult pain. On the other hand, there are some surprises where Laramie County here in Cheyenne is up about 8% year over year on the uh, June receipts. Casper is up 15%. Rollins, primarily due to the um, uh, extraordinary wind development, is up 71%. Uh, year over year with their sales and use tax uh, collections for the month of June. And uh, Park County and Converse County, as expected, uh, Park County is down 18%, very similar to Teton County and Converse County, very similar to Sublette, down 58%. Getting into the industry uh, changes, these won't really, I, I think only one will be of a, a surprise. Lodging and accommodation statewide year over year for the month of June was down 35%. That's about what uh, Craig was anticipating. Uh, mining overall is down 66%. That suggests a lot less pipe is being purchased, a lot less uh, equipment is being purchased for the mines. Um, what is somewhat surprising is the strength of retail. Despite all of the unemployment, uh, retail overall is up 4%. Uh, year over year for the month of June, and in particular, online retail is up 109%. So very strong growth with the retail. Um, one odd or, or, or perhaps uh, interesting point on the industry, uh, the largest growth factor is in automobile sales. It shows up as public administration, but that counts all of the license plates. And these don't just include automobiles, so campers, trailers, RVs, uh, the total sales tax collections up 41% uh, shows uh, very robust growth in, in that area. This retail sales and even perhaps the auto sales can be in part explained by the federal infusion of uh, uh, economic support via the IRS checks to individuals and children, the paycheck or payroll protection program, uh, increases for unemployment insurance, as well as the state funding through the CARES Act that has been distributed uh, throughout the state. Uh, given this, um, it is certainly influencing the behavior of uh, businesses and uh, consumer consumption choices. In fact, the Federal Reserve in its uh, efforts in the 
uh, monetary system are also impacting arguably uh, decisions with refinances statewide for lower mortgage costs and providing additional funds uh, for uh, discretionary uh, consumption by uh, consumers. All of this is resulting in a dramatic economic reorientation of winners and losers, where we have uh, businesses such as uh, restaurant and lodging, as mentioned, that are struggling mightily, as well as uh, service um, support in the extractive industries. And then you have certain types of retail uh, that are really enjoying a, a strong boom. Um, doing the math uh, from this um, from this July summary, I would not uh, change at this time uh, the Craig uh, outlook for the next biennium uh, significantly, although Craig will collectively discuss this in October. If anything, we are slightly more, or we are closer to that high revenue outcome as opposed to the base revenue outcome in the May uh, Craig report. Uh, we're still working in an environment of significant uncertainty. Um, sales and use taxes are higher, oil prices somewhat higher, but there is, uh, in my opinion, some concern of, as to the sustainability of the economic momentum in the absence of uh, continued federal support. So once you take away the liquidity and the federal economic boosts, um, in the absence of additional uh, federal policy actions there, uh, those uh, retail numbers are unlikely to uh, be uh, supported long-term. What does this mean overall? Um, in conclusion, uh, rather than that $877 million, we might be looking at $760 million. Uh, the governor has at least verbally articulated a 10% reduction that would take another 250 million off of that 760. So you're left with about a $510 million shortfall that is today unaddressed. That could be addressed in a variety of manners. For example, Craig in October could reduce that $510 million shortfall for the biennium even further. Or policy actions, uh, for example, use of the rainy day fund, additional reductions by the executive branch or the legislative branch, or revenue enhancements, that's taxes, uh, would also address that $510 million um, figure. Um, nonetheless, Wyoming has a, and I've said this before, a structural revenue expenditure disconnect. It has been exacerbated and accelerated by COVID-19. And even uh, due to the uh, short-term positive response, uh, results of the July revenue update, uh, those underlying fundamentals are not anticipated to go away. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll pause and answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Don. Okay, questions. I see Representative Summers. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I'm envious that you sit on top of Union Pass and I don't. Um, so, uh, Don, I guess my question to you is, is uh, and I didn't quite get the number, so I got the seven, we're, we're kind of going to move that 877 to 760 on the general fund side, but I didn't hear, I, I kind of missed what you would move that 541 number on K-12 down to. And then as a follow-up on that, I know you have provided me some information kind of on the optimistic side that you know on the opt optimistic projection that maybe that 21 22 biennium on education was somewhere in the 250 some million so is there that much different i guess my question is is the optimistic and the and the normal or the your run of the your your regular craig forecast and your optimistic on schools, is there is there quite a difference in that? And could you kind of speak to that a little bit? Go ahead, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Summers, um, e excellent question. And, and just to be clear, that 760 number, that's not an official forecast, that's just our pacing, but we are uh, experiencing a, uh, an uptick there. With respect to the school side, I apologize. I think Representative Summers, you point out, I, I failed to mention that it would reduce uh, the July revenue update would reduce the 541 down to 514. So not much uh, benefit there, about you know $29 million or, or $26 million, something like that. 
Um, if you move those now from the uh, base case scenario to the optimistic case scenario, and I'm not suggesting that is the environment we're, but we're, that we're living in, but we're certainly moving toward that, at least in the short term, uh, you would improve the general fund outlook by about $200 million. So take that 760 and, and you can knock off another $200 million all over the course of the biennium. On the school side, the 514 would reduce by about $100 million. I'm rounding just a little bit there, but that's a pretty good uh, point estimate. So that 514 would become uh, just over $400 million on the school side. Uh, you still, as I indicated, have that structural revenue expenditure um, disconnect. Yeah, and Don, that that difference, I'm just doing the math in my head. We were, before we were like about a 1.4, we said $1.5 billion structural deficit, but actually the numbers were about 1.42 or something like that. So now what you're saying, optimistically, with these, the latest uh, estimates that were coming out of, with, out of our office, LSO predictions, we're down to still about a billion dollars. That's the number I come up with. Is that accurate, Don? Uh, yeah, that 760 and, and 514, about a billion two. So we've, we, we've made up some ground, but not significant ground. Well, and, and, Don, really, and Don, is that the optimistic look? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, no. Under the optimistic look, you would reduce that by about another 300 million, 200 on the general fund side, 100 on the school foundation side. So that would bring it down further to right at 900 uh, million to a billion dollars, exactly as you described. Yeah, what I'd like to have you do is just do a little quick summary and shoot it out to us just so we get those numbers right. But I got them in my mind. Representative Larson, I see you had your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don, my question then is, is, is you, as you laid this out for us today, it appears that we've got, and I don't know the right word to, to, to use here, whether it be artificial or stimulus or one time, but, but in your calculations, the, the, the improvements that we're seeing in this forecast has got the, some stimulus or some one-time funding that will, uh, has the potential of only being short-lived. And so we, we've really done nothing. We, we're really not seeing a whole lot, and correct me if I'm seeing this wrong, we're not seeing a whole lot there that has addressed that structural revenue expenditure deficit or improved that. We're just seeing the impact of that stimulus or the CARES and some of these other uh, things that's improved our, um, our outlook. Is, uh, am I missing the boat there? Go ahead, Don. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, I think that is a pretty good uh, assessment of, of it. I think there will be some folks and some economists that will argue that this economic stimulus is an attempt to prime the pump and that it may not in fact entirely be one time. There, there is a multiplier effect when uh, people have additional cash in their pockets and they spend it and then the uh, proprietor who is the beneficiary of that spending uh, can invest uh, more so there is a there is a hope that this stimulus will uh, infuse some positive um, activity. The downside is all of the stimulus is on the retail side, candidly in Wyoming, and that is not the foundation for our tax system. The Wyoming's tax system is based on um, mineral extraction. Follow up, Mr. Go Chair. ahead, go ahead, Representative Larson. And, and Don, I guess that was that's part of my follow up. The answer it is is that stimulus doesn't impact how we generate revenue historically here in Wyoming. And th there's still some tweaking that probably, well, that's an opinion there. There's a, uh, it, it doesn't resolve where, where we're struggling on revenue generation. Go ahead, Don. Mr. Chairman, Representative, I, I think that is a reasonable assessment. I think there's a hope that this consumer spending will generate energy demand in other states, but you're essentially um, accurate. Okay, committee, any other questions of Don on this? Go ahead, Reverend Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in your optimistic version, you anticipate another 300 million ballpark. What are the primary sources of that 300 million? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Schwartz, 
uh, it is across the board. There is uh, growth in sales and use tax, and that's candidly what is looking the most uh, optimistic. Um, so a, a good portion, I don't know the exact proportion of it, but I would say at least a third is sales and use tax. And, and quite frankly, we're on the trajectory for the high revenue case on sales and use tax. Where we're not on the trajectory, uh, candidly, is in the extractive industries. Oil price is a little bit ahead, but other than that, we're not seeing you know, material gains in production, material gains in natural gas, material gains in coal. So the outlook for that high revenue scenario on the extractive side is, uh, is not as likely as the sales and use tax side. Thank you. Well, Don, and the other thing too, on the, on the oil side of it, well, gas as well. And when, you know, if you're not drilling, you're in a, you're in a deep, you're depleting your resources. You're actually going down. And we had only first time in Wyoming history, had no rigs drilling here a couple of weeks ago. I think we may have one rig now. Do you have any updates on how many rigs we might see through the rest of the year? Or that is probably a pretty good guess, but I doubt that we'll see more than three or four rigs up. Have you heard anything in that regard? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think uh, you were dropped when I mentioned that. I have heard uh, the rumblings of a couple of uh, rigs. In fact, one natural gas rig potentially uh, returning and uh, an oil rig or, or so. But um, I have not heard widespread uh, plans to uh, restart that this fall. Well, and of course, the thing about that, uh, and when you did your projections with Craig, did, you know, you anticipated the rig count to be a certain number and you can quantify that and look through the, the results of what the rigs would be expected to produce. And we were at 25 to 30 rigs generating the kind of revenue we had if we're down to three or four. Did you take that in consideration in your Craig? I believe you did. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we did. In fact, we anticipated essentially no new production for the balance of calendar year uh, 2020. Um, so we absolutely considered that. And even if we do get uh, a small number of rigs returning, um, this fall, it's unlikely that those will generate uh, material volumes this fall. It may be the winter or the summer before they're brought fully online. Well, and the other thing about that, if you look at some of the parts of our country, particularly the Permian Basin, where they don't have to deal with all the federal bureaucracy we deal with and the other issues that make it so difficult in Wyoming to drill and do in a responsible manner, you know, they're not even picking up rigs. And I think the national rig count even went down last week around 250, which is just a huge, huge decline. And I'm not sure when that'll come back if it does. Representative Larson, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don, going back to the retail sales, <clears throat> and, and what I heard you say is that we, we're showing retail up <clears throat> 4%. And so I, I'm going to call that Main Street retail, and but yet you're showing online retail up 109%. Has Craig looked at the impacts of online retail sales, the impact that has on Main Street retail sales, um, and the potential loss of retail sales on Main Street and property taxes and, and those sort of things? Because it looks like we're seeing a, a real shift there. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, uh, we have done a lot of that. We have not taken it down to the point of your last uh, phrase there, property taxes. We've not made that link um, of a decline in commercial property taxes due to a decline in, in retail sales. Uh, we certainly take into account the uh, increases in law online and historically the reduction in the brick and mortar sales. Um, so we do take those into account. I believe this month where I mentioned 108% is the last month, which would have been June, 2020 uh, of uh, online sales now has a full year with all entities paying. That is the uh, third party marketers as well as the primary online realtors. So I, I think next month's numbers are going to be the best uh, indicator of what did COVID have to do? So now we're comparing apples to apples, meaning the third party marketers were paying online sales tax last July. They're paying it this July. So now the only Delta or only difference between the two 
is the impact from COVID as well as the general trend uh, to online and away from brick and mortar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Don. Committee, any other questions? Committee. Don, I have I have a question. And when I when I think about COVID, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those issues and where we are, but it seems to me that the PPP program that went out to Wyoming employers was around 1.1 to 1.2 billion. Of course, this came out of the this came directly from the appropriations out of Washington, and not including, you know, the amount of money that we've done with our bills that we did in the special session. And I thought that number was 475, and and that out of that, about 300 to 350 went to our businesses. So clearly, COVID has really hit a made a substantial impact to all the businesses in Wyoming. And, and I think you're going to see that in the sales tax side of that, where they're spending more money. I'm seeing that and talking to businesses up here, whatever piece of equipment they may have wanted, they weren't buying it. Now they're buying it with PPP money. So that's had a huge impact on that. And uh, so that, that will not continue, of course, as we move forward. Okay. Any other questions of Don on this particular part of the agenda? on Craig or the estimates. The other thing too, Don, when you do that, the little estimate for us, that cheat sheet, if you will, throw in there the, uh, if we if we go with the optimistic approach and then the more realistic, which is the 1.2 billion that you mentioned earlier, throw in there what that would do if we did nothing to our LISRA account. I think it would deplete it substantially, but that number escaped me what that might be. So if we did nothing and we spent it all, what would we have at the end of the two years and that, that, would be, that would be my question if you could provide that information. Okay, there being nothing else, we'll go to the next item on our agenda. In fact, we're actually on time. Let's talk about what Congress is up to. Don, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we'll make up a little bit of time here as well. I'll provide an update of congressional action. Uh, when we developed this uh, agenda uh, just a week or two ago, um, the House, Senate, and administration were in uh, discussions. Those discussions have not yet borne fruit. Um, but looking, looking back, the House uh, position um, has the $3 trillion, $3 trillion plus heroes package. That also included additional new funds for states, as well as flexibility. Uh, those new funds for Wyoming, and of course, these formulas were likely to change in any negotiation, but to give you a sense, that might uh, generate an additional half a billion dollars in fiscal year 21 and a half a billion dollars in fiscal year 22 under the House proposal. Uh, those uh, funds would be relatively flexible compared to the CARES Act fund, which have uh, pretty strict restrictions on the expenditure of those. The HEALS Act, which is the Senate Majority Leader's package of proposals, it's actually multiple bills um, that is being negotiated against the House position, is approximately $1 trillion. It has no new money um, for general state government. It does have uh, new money for specific entities. So there's uh, higher education funding in there. There's K-12 education funding, but not funding that goes directly to the state akin to the $1.25 billion uh, in CARES Act funding. Uh, there is uh, additional flexibility in, um, in these funds uh, for the $1.25 in the Senate position, and that includes an extension of the deadline from December 30th uh, to actually September 28th would be Wyoming's deadline. There is also uh, flexibility in the purposes for which the funds can be expended, specifically allowing a portion of the funds, roughly one quarter of the 1.25 billion could be used to shore up lost revenue. Again, when we prepared the agenda, um, the leaders of the House, Senate and the uh, presidential administration were in discussions. Those discussions uh, have not borne fruit as uh, it sits now, I think there are four paths forward um, on this, and I'll walk through each of those uh, scenarios very briefly. Uh, one option, and it is uh, potentially a likely well, option. Before, before you do, you mentioned that there would be 250 million on the Senate position for lost revenues. Now, would that be a situation where lost revenues to the state 
lost revenues to cities, towns, and counties, all government lost revenues, nothing for individuals. Is that, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's exactly correct. Uh, it would apply to primary, the state, as well as secondary governments, local uh, communities. And there is a cap on that at 25% of the total 1.25 billion could be used for foregone revenues. So if we, if that happened, in fact, and we've already allocated, we probably over allocated the 1.25 billion, there'd be a, a reshuffling of the deck, if you will, of where all that money would go. And then that would, a decision would be made by the, the governor's office, obviously, or if we had a special session and we knew that answer, we might do it there. Would that be correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's entirely correct with one caveat. Uh, the total amount that could be used for foregone revenue is $312 million. I think you will hear this afternoon in a couple of presentations, one from LSO and one from the governor's office, where the $1.25 billion has been fully allocated. So your reshuffling is uh, right on point. There's also a second requirement uh, in order to use uh, the $312 million for lost revenue, uh, you must provide a like amount to local governments. Wyoming has not done that yet. So you must share $312 million with local governments in order to use $312 million for lost revenue. If you do that, that takes half of the $1.25 billion and uh, our, our allocations far exceed that at this time. Interesting discussion we'll have there. Representative Larson, go ahead. And Don, those are just caps. They're not. They're not a firm price. You can use up to twenty-five percent, and and then likewise on the. Uh, but you have to use a like amount to locals. Whatever whatever we use, then a like amount has to be shifted to locals. Is that correct? That's how I understand it. Yes. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Don. Uh, so the, the four scenarios going forward is no action is uh, option one, and, and that actually has a, a fair bit of uh, potential behind it. You have undoubtedly seen in uh, press statements from both the uh, leadership of the House, leadership of the Senate, as well as the uh, chief of staff or the Treasury Secretary of the administration, um, that there are significant philosophical differences between the two uh, positions and that there is uh, currently no uh, immediate path forward. So that no action is a, a real action, meaning the December 30th deadline remains, uh, the uh, restrictions on the 1.25 billion remain, and there is no uh, relief or adjustment uh, to those. The second option is in light of the fact that uh, Congress has not uh, adopted a budget or its traditional 13 appropriations bills for both the House and the Senate, undoubtedly, or it is likely that uh, in order to fund the federal government and avoid a shutdown on October 1st, there will be a continuing resolution. Uh, in their nomenclature, they refer to it as a CR. That continuing resolution essentially allows the government to continue to operate. Um, last year, it was a quote unquote clean continuing resolution, which uh, included very few riders or additional footnotes or designation, but that is not always the case. That continuing resolution, which would be adopted in September in all likelihood um, to avoid a government shutdown could include pieces of either the HEALS Act or the HEROES Act. Specifically, it could include pieces where the two um, entities agree such as uh, increased unemployment, increased funding for uh, schools who elect to reopen, uh, potentially even some state flexibility on their $1.25 billion. So that's option number two, is that some language is inserted into a continuing resolution. Option number three is you could get uh, some consensus through further negotiation over the intervening weeks between the leaders and end up somewhere between the trillion dollar package and the three trillion dollar package and provide some additional funds for states, potentially some flexibility. And then the fourth option is a pared down bill. And there are already some um, legislators, individual legislators, not necessarily part of leadership who have sponsored uh, a pared down uh, um, 
piece of legislation which addresses a few areas where they can find uh, some bipartisan agreement and that draft is authored by a small group of either senators or, or House members, primarily senators in the case I'm speaking of. Um, so we will continue to track this, um, but the, uh, the current um, scenario is uh, uh, no action until um, further notice. Okay, thank you, Don. Any other questions, committee? Oh, I see one. Representative Summers, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Don, I might have missed this in your four options, um, but it was one of your four options that they just wait till the general election and that decides what the option is. Was that one of your four? And how, and if so, I missed it. If not, is that a likely scenario? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, certainly, for example, the get consensus or even a subsequent continuing resolution could occur after the general election in November. That's certainly a option. Um, I have not heard a, a whole lot about uh, that. It would depend on how it how it shakes out. So if there is, for example, a new administration uh, or a change in the um, majority party of the Senate in particular, uh, there may be a fair bit of incentive for uh, the minority party or the incoming party in those cases to wait until they have uh, full control to make 100% of the decisions in January rather than uh, negotiate with the party that um, they have shown to have severe disagreements with. Well, the reality of it is, Don, depending on that general election in November, if the, the existing party that has sort of has control of what's going on out of Washington loses, then you're gonna be looking at a $3 trillion package probably, or maybe even more money. And if they don't, then it, the negotiations and the other scenarios will probably continue and we'll see what happens. Could very well be that nothing happens really till after that November date, which is, is too bad because that really puts a lot of people and a lot of states in an awkward position. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. On the um, the half on the three twelve um, for five percent, is it is that does that deal with the previous or what has not been um, previously appropriated? So, for example, with the one hundred five to locals, um, uh, would that could, could we include that or not include it? Or if we cut it and then add it back, um, would be that another way to do it? I mean, what's, what, what's your thought process on that? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, I think, well, the, the Senate proposal as written uh, maintains any previously budgeted uh, funds cannot be used. Um, so the $105 million of LSRA funds uh, supporting uh, municipalities could not be entered into any of the computations here. However, um, I do think that uh, uh, grants made to local, and actually it's not just local governments, I think their term is political subdivisions. So I believe the executive branch believes that not only uh, municipalities and counties would count towards that, but school districts are also a political subdivision in Wyoming. Any funds that they have received already through the governor's distributions, through SLIB grants, would count towards that uh, 312 um, figure, $312 million figure. Yeah, so Don, if you look at the, uh, and particularly the schools, I think the, the federal dollars outside our 1.25 billion is already around $75 million that's gone to K through 12. And I'm not sure about the university and community college. So what you're saying is if we took the 312 and decided to split it off and give it to some cities and towns and counties, the 105 would come into play and for schools, at least the 75 million would come into play as well. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, no. The, anything outside of the 1.25 billion does not come into play. So any funds that were directed to school districts outside of the 1.25 do not come into play. I believe, however, the governor has included additional funds to K-12, as well as SLIB has provided additional funds to 
counties and cities through their grant process, those funds are part of the 1.25 billion and could be counted as part of the $312 billion going to political subdivisions. You know, Don, what we're gonna have is it's kind of the way we have that distribution of all the FMRs, lines going everywhere. When we look at all the money that's available and how we pull this together, it's gonna to be very interesting and we're gonna need that information. And Mr. Co-Chair, probably a lot of this might come to fruition when we meet in October, we'll have a little bit better idea, particularly if we have a special session before. So there's still some unknowns. Okay, committee, any other questions of Don on, on the COVID from the congressional level? Any other questions? Don, I have one. Anything happen about the definition of incurred? Has there been any discussion, you know, because that's obviously a sticking point and particularly the way we want to spend some money on rural hospitals. Anything on that uh, in any of these bills? I haven't seen it. Do you have any ideas? Uh, no, none of the drafts uh, of, of congressional legislation uh, speak to uh, changes to that definition. Uh, I think you are aware the, the Treasury Department did come out and clarified their language on that, and I'll read that to you. Um, this is not new, so this occurred, I think, in end of June or, or first part of July. And it states the Treasury is clarifying that for a cost to be considered to have been incurred, performance or delivery must occur during the covered period, which ends December 20, 30th, 2020, but payment of funds need not be made during that time, though it is generally expected that this will take place within 90 days of the cost being incurred. So what that means is that the services or the goods need to be delivered, but the invoice has a traditional uh, lag time to be paid. So they are suggesting a 90 day delay in payment, but the services have to be uh, fully completed by the December 30th. And, and that is a challenge with a number of the grants that have uh, been before uh, the slip board. Well, but I would argue that when you use the word performance, performance would be, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a, an institution completely built. If you look at the, the you know, Sublette County, you know, over Pinedale, we look at Saratoga, Riverton, performance could very well be they're performing under an existing contract to build an X amount of money is going towards that. So I think when you have the word performance in there and it says, or not and, I think there's, there's that, now we have another definition of performance. And does it mean performance of a contractual agreement or does it mean performance of actually having something completed? So I think that, I think that opens the door there as well. Go ahead, Don. Uh, I'd be happy to share. I just read one, one sentence. It does go on to say the cost of good or service received during the cover period will not be considered under um, 601 eligibility. Goods delivered in the cover period need not be used during the period in all cases. Um, for example, uh, the, good, the good must be delivered in December in order to be available for use in January could be covered using the payments from the fund. So they go through a number of smaller examples about uh, delivery. In fact, they get down to types of delivery, whether it's a bulk purchase um, or a durable good. And, and I'll, I, I won't read all the way through uh, those, but I'd be happy to share that with the committee in my follow-up. Well, we're gonna need to have that when we look at these rural hospitals. And certainly there again, you talk about the deliverance of goods, you know, the engineering costs, the architectural costs, the, the division, you know, the infrastructure costs are all deliverable goods. And if they're there before December 30th, then I think you could use COVID funds for them. So I think there's still a lot of a lot of room there in terms of definition. Go ahead, Reverend Larson. A couple of questions, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Don, and that is, so do they differentiate between goods and services? So to pile on what uh, Chairman Bebout just pointed out, architectural engineering would be services rather than goods. It, it, at least in in my mind, and then those goods, uh, and we'll just use construction as an example. It uh, when when we say delivered, does that mean they have to be on site, or does that just mean that they need to be uh, purchased and staged? for use, or does it go into that type of detail? Go ahead. 
uh, Mr. Chairman, it generally uh, combines the term good and service uh, in, the, in the same uh, phrase, uh, but the examples, uh, to your point, uh, Representative, the examples are limited to goods delivered. It does not provide any examples of services delivered. Well, the bottom line is this, it will, it'll all happen when there's an audit somewhere down go to those audits may occur in the year 2022 and then and then that's a long ways down so it is we lost you mr chairman Or I lost you. I think he just got audited. <laughs> it's, it's that union pass thing, Mr. Co Chairman. All right. Okay, are we back? Yes, Mr. Chairman. You're have we to... still got the uh, co-chair? Yeah. There he is. There he is. So, so uh, Mr. Co-Chair, we didn't hear that your, la your last comments did not come through. Actually, actually, Mr. Co-Chair, and I apologize to the members of the committee and, and Bob, if you lose me up here, just, you know, as you normally would do anyway, just take over and run the meeting. But uh, what I was, was talking about is a lot of those, inf that information will not be decided until possibly 2022 as to what happened with how the money was spent. So. Once again, a lot of unknowns. Okay, moving right along. Any other question? Yeah, I see Reverend Schwartz's hand is up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was wanting to go back to the, uh, you know, replacing lost revenues in terms of what we can accredit already to local governments and subdivisions. So two things, do hospital districts count as a political subdivision? And then if we look at all the political subdivisions schools, local governments. Do we have a total for what we've already allocated to them? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe uh, that question would be best posed right after lunch to the governor's office. They have uh, some better data on that, but I and, and I, I would also defer to them in terms of their interpretation. It is, it is their position, not mine that counts. Um, but I believe that they have included uh, counties cities, towns, school districts, uh, community college districts, and some hospitals as uh, political subdivisions. Of course, not all hospitals are political subdivisions in Wyoming, um, but I believe in their documents that I have been privy to, it's encompassing all of those uh, entities. In, in fact, I think it would go further to some other special districts if there is a a water district or a conservation district that benefited from, um, say, testing of uh, sewage for COVID or something like that. I think there are a few of those odd examples um, that that may very well uh, be included in Wyoming's definition of political subdivision. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, Senator Guru. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don, as long as we're on that subject, um, would that include money that we hadn't allocated under the CARES Act, but was allocated under the CARES Act by Congress? What I'm thinking here is there, there are a lot of other monies that were put out in the CARES Act that went directly to other entities in the state. Does that count towards that too? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, no, it is just the 1.25. It's, it's, kind of the state's pot that is being uh, divvied up. 
Just want to make sure. Thank you. Anything else, committee? Okay, next thing on our agenda is to look at some proposed draft legislation. And Don, the first thing I see is 21 LSO-0020, state funded capital construction. So go ahead, Who is uh, Anna going to take us to talk about this or is that the way? Anna, I see your smiling face, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you said, this is 21 LSO 20 formal draft 1.0, state funded capital construction. The committee moved to sponsor this bill draft at its last meeting. I will quickly go over the amendments that the committee adopted at the last meeting and then open it up to the committee for any questions. Since this, hit, since this has already been adopted for sponsorship by the committee, any amendments that the committee would like to pursue now to this current version would require a motion to reconsider first. So starting with section two, this appropriates money for capital construction projects administered through the state construction department. If you turn to the table on page four, uh, the committee at its last meeting uh, first, they decreased the other funds appropriation on line eight for the state construction department level one and level two studies from 500,000 to 300,000. Second, they removed funding for the Western Wyoming Community College nursing facility and three, the committee removed the funding and the footnote in this section related to the Northern Wyoming Community College District Construction Technology Center. Turning to section four on page nine, the committee made an amendment to this section um, to require management council to appoint two members of the management council and one member of the legislature at large for the subcommittee that provides recommendation on the Capitol Square preservation. Uh, the committee also made an amendment on page 10 on lines eight and nine. This is the appropriation from SIPA to the state construction department. They, the committee reduced this appropriation by half, and this appropriation would be for um, interpretive exhibits and wayfinding and signage in the Capitol and the Capitol Extension and Herschler Building. The committee also removed the section on the rural healthcare facilities, um, and that language has been um, modified and included in the bill draft that the committee will consider next. And lastly, the committee added a new section that is on page 13. Uh, this provides that up to $1,880,000 that was appropriated from the general fund to the Department of Family Services for the McGee Building remodel is reappropriated for purposes of the remodel of the Emerson Building at the Wyoming Life Resource Center. So, Mr. Chairman, that is the amendments to the bill, and I'll open it back up to the committee. Okay, committee, any questions on the current bill that we now have in front of you that we passed during our last meeting here a month or, month or so ago? Any questions on the current bill? Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to move um, to reconsider to reopen the bill. That motion is in order. Do we have a second? I see Representative Summer second it, and as well as Representative Walters to reconsider uh, I don't know that we need a roll call vote on this. Uh, so all in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Okay, I'm counting. Hold them up, please. I want to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. I count six votes. Is that correct? Let me count them again. One, let's do a roll call vote and make sure we get it. Go ahead. Uh, the motion is uh, to reconsider LSO 0020, formal draft 1.0. Representative Kinner. Aye. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Larson votes aye. Representative Olson. Aye. Representative Schwartz. Aye. Representative Summers. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Senator Agar. Senator Garou? No. Senator Hicks? No. Senator Kinsky? No. Co-Chairman Nicholas? Aye. Chairman Bebout? No. Mr. Chairman, there are uh, seven ayes, four no's, one excused.
Okay, by your vote, we have voted to reconsider the, the bill that we've talking about. Mr. Not Chairman? To, yeah, Mr. go Chairman? ahead. Go ahead, Senator Kinski. A point of order, if it, if it takes a majority of both bodies to pass a bill, would it not take a majority of both bodies to reconsider a bill? I do not believe so, Senator Kinski. Okay. Good. Am I wrong on that, Anna? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd have to look at the committee rules. Um, uh, if, if Tamara's available, maybe she knows off the top of her head on that. If it's just a vote to sponsor bills that require a majority of both houses. Mr. Yeah, Chairman, I believe take, that's correct. Yeah, my take on this would be the reconsideration vote, you know, does not require a majority of both bodies. However, after reconsidering, if we in fact amend the bill and then the amendments do pass, then once again, we vote on the bill, that would require a two thirds vote or a majority vote of each body. That's my interpretation of our rule. Anybody have any reason not agree with me on that? Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, I just Mr. say for the record, for whatever it's worth, I mean, we're clearly I, I'm gonna lose, but I don't know how we can require a majority of both to sponsor the thing and not require to, for reconsideration, but let's forge ahead. We will. Okay, the motion for consideration reconsideration has passed. We're now back on the bill. And I, are there any proposed amendments to the bill? I believe Representative Summers has circulated a, a, a proposed amendment. Is that correct, Representative Summers? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, no, that's on the broadband piece on the other bill. Just a clarification on something else, not on this bill, no. Okay, are there any proposed amendments to this bill? Representative Walters, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Try and get unmuted there. I'd like to uh, move to allow the University of Wyoming Law School, uh, Alan K. Simpson Center for Legal Services Project to proceed with any funds available, including private, public, or other any other funds available and allow the authorization of up to 24 million for the total cost of the project. And if I get a second, I'll explain that. Uh, Representative Olson has Second. seconded. Go ahead, Representative Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all this is doing, members, is allowing the law school project to proceed uh, for the Legal Studies Center as, as we've all been educated on it over the past several months. It's similar to what we're doing for the community colleges. Uh, there is no state dollars included in this motion. Uh, it's just allowing for the total the university to proceed with the project. This is a shovel ready project. Uh, and if they're, then they have raised- Just one second, Representative Walters. Senator Kinski, would you mute please? You're getting some background from you. You're Go the university ahead. Is on, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The university has raised approximately 6 million of this 24 already. Uh, and they have other commitments coming forward and so like I said, it's a shovel ready project uh, the, and this allows the university to proceed using their funds, other funds, private funds, uh, whatever might come about and it just authorizes that up to 24 million. Uh, like I said, it's very similar to what we do for the community colleges when they're using their, their own dollars. Okay, any, go ahead, Representative Greer, question. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm sorry, um, thank you. Representative Walters, did I understand you correctly when you said um, no state dollars is to be to be used expended in this on this uh, proposal? Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. What I've said is any funds available. I'm not designating any state funds towards this project, so I'm not allocating or asking for SIPA general funds or or anything like that in this proposal. Now, if the university chooses to take some of the dollars they receive in their block grant and apply it towards that, that's out of our purview. Uh, but but I am not, in, in this proposal, I'm not asking for any general fund SIPA or anything else. It's just the authorization to spend any funds they choose or see fit. Thank okay, you. I have a question on this, Representative Walters. I'm not sure why we want the state legislature to, to, to 
weigh in on this and authorize. I know that in fact, the University of Wyoming through the Board of Trustees and other funds available have in fact initiated construction, major capital construction projects without legislative approval. One comes to mind, I believe is the gateway. Now I could be wrong on that, but I think the gateway was done entirely with other funds, uh, whatever they were, they were not state dollars. There was no legislative approval to do that. They chose to do so internally with the Board of Trustees making that motion. Why do we now wanna be involved and, and say, okay, go ahead with the law school and in, in actual, you know, history has shown they can do it anyway. Why do you want us to be involved? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, having the state construction department involved in what they're doing, make sure we end up with a quality project over there. Well, Representative Walters, are you saying the Gateway Center was not a quality project? I believe the board of trustees went outside, got the architectural engineering done all on their own nickel, their own time. And, and we weren't involved in that at that particular time. There may be other projects too. I'm trying to remember, maybe Don can chime in and see where that's happened in the past potentially, but I still fail to see why we wanna be involved when they, don't, they can do it without us. Well, nobody, oh, Representative, go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. Sure. Um, well I think this is an issue that um, that you have um, opounded on, for example, when Game and Fish and or with other state agencies go out and use their own money and, and do some major construction, that um, that's not a good practice. And with regards to the U UW, I think it's a, I think it's important for us to keep some control over what the construction processes are on campus. Um, if, whether it's the dorms, whether it's um, athletic facilities or whatever it is, um, particularly if there's, you know, because ultimately there, tip, there tends to be some date state dollars involved because if they use block grant fund dollars to do it or if they use reserves that came from block grant fund dollars, I, I think we should have a responsibility and a, a liability to pay attention and to authenticate it and to be part of it. And so. It's probably um, when they don't do it, we should reprimand them or say, or we should jump in and say, hey, this is the way it's supposed to happen. And so uh, the, uh, I think it's a better part of practice. Uh, what this also just, it, this gives them at least a, uh, the, you know, what may happen is they may begin a project and, and shell out part of a building and, or, you know, they'll go in and if they can raise another five or 10 million, um, and, and do a reduced um, version of this just to move forward, um, then they're gonna try to do it. Part of the problem is that the, because of COVID restrictions and several other things that are going on on campus, they've had to shut down two or three of their clinics because their off-campus facilities that they were, were renting um, don't have sufficient spacing and COVID protections. So they've shut down two or three of their eight um, clinic practices and just for the whole semester and the whole year. Um, and so the, uh, they need to do something in order to uh, expand space um, at, to serve the indigent people in the state of Wyoming. And so uh, this just gets them out the door if they choose to do it, that they can start doing something. And I think we should be telling them if they can do it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Cho, Co-Chair. Good comments. Uh, just a couple of things. You, you mentioned what I opined on about Game and Fish and YDOT, and my success was zero on all of that. Uh, I had some concerns about what they did, and they did it anyway. So that's, uh, that took care of that. The second thing is you're talking about some of the inability to provide services to the students. If you decided to do this, uh, it won't be completed in time, maybe COVID hopefully it'd be in the rear view mirror, it wouldn't be done and functional until maybe I'll, I would ask that question. Okay, so you get the go ahead. They're short about $18 million. If that miraculously showed up tomorrow, when would that facility even be in place so they could utilize it? Anybody have an Mr. answer? Chairman. That? Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Senator Kinski, go ahead. Yeah, 
I just I, I'm confused, and I, I just a question for Representative Walters and Rep, Representative Nicholas. In any other circumstance, if it were me trying to get into the university's rhubarb, I, you'd, you'd be telling me about their block grant independence. So I'm not sure why in this circumstance we want to weigh in on it. It, it just I, I don't get it. What what am I missing here? Why are, why is it even necessary to debate this? They've got the authority. They can raise the money. They can spend it. I hear what Chairman Nicholas is saying. We need to be in there supervising it. I, I'm not sure that's the case, but just help me to understand why in this instance, instead of talking about the block grant and the university's independence, we need to be in there managing the process for them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I feel like I'm missing something. I think President Summers may have an answer. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I have an answer, but you know, we don't need, we don't know the future of of COVID bills coming out of the federal government. And one thing that uh, we do know is in order to, I, I think, and I, I'm, you'd know this much better than me, Mr. Chairman, but if we allocate um, federal dollars, you know, they're kind of asked, that does have to be allocated. And so I think this just sets the stage for, for anything that may, may be available now or later on the federal level, frankly, that we may be able to put towards this project. So I think that that would be one reason in, in my mind to do it. Uh, of course, the, the, one, the answer to that, Representative Summers, if we took that position on this particular project and everything COVID related, we might need to say we bless it before it happens. And anyway, that's a whole nother discussion. Senator Grew, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, that's actually just what I was going to say. If that were true, and if that was the way we wanted to proceed, wouldn't this be better served as an amendment in a COVID bill? Um, that uh, and and then do it straight up. Then those COVID monies became available to do the things that uh, that the good co-chair and the and the bringer of the amendment want to do as far as building a building that is um, you know safe and and works from a COVID standpoint, that that would be the place to do it. Well, um, that's a very good point, Go Mr. Ahead. Co-Chair, if I can. That's a very good point, uh, Senator Gru. And when we debate the next bill, there's gonna be amendment to add the law school in it. So it's coming. I knew I could count Are on you it. assuming that it won't pass in this particular bill? Is that, the, is that what you're saying there, Co-Chairman Nicholas? No, I, what I'm saying that but um, either way, we want them to have the authority to move forward. And by doing this, this'll, it'll be an assistance for us to raise money. It'll be a, a, an opportunity for the law school to go out and get some major donors. We're looking at um, you know, some three to $5 million inputs from various um, foundations out there that really wanna support these clinics. Uh, you know, particularly because the, you know, it's three to $4 million of indigent free legal services they provide every year. So, so we're, we're, you know, we're chasing down every rabbit hole to, to find money for it. But um, once we have it authorized, it makes our job a lot easier. Well, I appreciate that. And we'll, we'll look forward to the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Reverend Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, uh, one of the big reasons that it's important is to show the legislative support for this project. Although we're just acknowledging that they can spend their own dollars, it shows a, the legislative support for this project as we recognize the value that these legal aid clinics provide to all the citizens of the state of Wyoming and how they have seen an uptick as uh, child, child uh, welfare cases, child uh, support payments are, are being delinquent because of the COVID issues and all of that. So these clinics are certainly being used at a much higher pace than they were prior to COVID. And uh, to the timing of construction, uh, yes, it's probably a year, year and a half to get completely, all of it completed. But I guess I would go back to the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. And so if we don't get started, uh, it will a year from now we'll be saying we wished we would have done that last year. And so, I, like I said, I go back to, I think this just shows our legislative support to answer Senator Kinski's comment about uh, why we need to do it and why we need to, to meddle in it. Like I said, I think it shows the legislative support and it does just authorize it. We do this for the community colleges, shows our support for those projects that come forward and, and some of those are in this, this bill already. And so uh, would encourage an I vote and thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. 
Yeah, the, the all right, go ahead, Senator Hicks. Mr. Chairman, uh, just a question for the, the, the proponents of the uh, amendment. It, it, do I understand it right that if we don't get this building built that the uh, law school is just gonna completely quit doing all clinics? Is that correct? At least it seems like it's been inferred that that's gonna happen, that this program would no longer function, it would go away. Well, and another question to add on to that about the clinics. Do we actually know that they're not functioning? Do we know the number of applications to utilize the clinics? Do we see where they're not being serviced or they're not provided? Representative Walter, you talked about extra costs. Can we, can we quantify those? Do we actually see them? Who wants to answer those questions? So, Mr. Co-Chair. Go ahead. The, <clears throat> we don't have quantifiable numbers. Obviously, they, they will never, if in any, uh, close down all of their clinics. They're, they have eight different clinics. They were adding, trying to add a new one uh, recently, uh, but they did have to shut down two of them and they have diminished their services because they can no longer operate out of the, uh, the building that where they were located. But the, um, they are still obviously performing the classes. Um, we will be able to get that hard data uh, from the law school, if, um, you know, if, if guys want it, we'll, we'll provide it to them. Yeah, thank you for that. Go ahead, Senator Hicks. Mr. Chairman, just, just one other question along that line is if, if, the, if they can't provide the clinics and the current facilities, given the $1.4 billion in new buildings we've built at the university in the last 12 years, is, is there some other facility on campus that they could provide these law clinics in or does it have to be connected to the law college building? Is, is there a lack of infrastructure there that they can't do this some other place? Go ahead. So the answer is I, I believe there is a lack of location to do it. And you know, we've done a lot of building at, at UW, but we haven't done anything on the law school. It's, it's kind of a standalone entity. It's kind of a lives on its own. The last two major uh, congression projects were all privately funded. And, um, the, and the law school was built, the last major construction for the law school was 1977. That's when the, when the law school was built. There's been a couple minor updates since then. Um, there was a Bremer edition and another, and another edition, but, um, and you might recall that with the, the, the law school is unique. Over 70% of the practicing lawyers in Wyoming come from this law school. Typically, they are the, and they're the only, even though they're the smallest uh, doctorate college, they're the only one that goes out and raises money to help construct their own buildings um, and to do these projects. So they're, they're rather unique in that. So they're, they're, they're probably the, um, the, we, they should be used as the shining star in terms of how, how they to use private dollars and, and graduates to accomplish and to expand and, and to you know, enhance the benefits of the law school. So it's, it's a pretty great program. Yeah, I'm not, not debating whether or not it's a great program, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, you said they're unique and they're the, the only ones that does this. Now I know the gateway Although that's not one of the colleges, that's certainly for the university, and and they did it all on their own. Uh, I guess we need to find out. I, I I seem to remember other cases where private donations were made. Uh, I think of the athletic department and some of the money that was raised there, although it was matching funds, but there were certainly things done there. I'm not sure we had legislative approval, although we probably did because we matched the funds. But I, I just uh, I still have an issue with it and. And we're setting a precedent here. And if you look at the university needs, I go back to the original budget they presented the Board of Trustees in terms of their capital construction to us did not include the law college. That came later, and I understand that. The question I would have now is the Board of Trustees out there requesting that we do this, or is this initiative that's just coming within the Joint Appropriations Committee? So the Board of Trustees have voted and approved the, the addition. I understand that, Mr. Co-Chair, but now do they expect us to put some language in there and say, go ahead, or are they going to go ahead without it? Uh, 
Uh, you don't have to answer that one. Uh, go ahead, Senator Hicks. You had a question? No. Okay, well, good discussion, committee. Any further discussion on this proposed amendment to the bill? Any further discussion? Okay, are we ready for the question? I see heads being nodded. Okay, uh, what I'm gonna do, Ann, is just because, you know, I wanna be sure I get these votes right. I'm gonna call for a roll call on this and then we'll know what the, the votes are. So please call the roll on the proposed amendment. And Anna, would you restate the amendment for everybody so we're sure we understand it? Mr. Chairman, I'll restate the amendment and I think um, Don will take the roll call. So this would be creating a new section in the bill draft to authorize UW Law School to proceed with the construction of the Allen K. Simpson Center for Legal Services project with any funds available, including private, public, or any other funds, it would be an authorization for up to 24 million. Thank you for that. Any, go ahead, Ryan Walters. Do you want to comment on that? Nope. That, that's correct. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Walters. Okay, everybody understand the proposed amendment? Don, call the roll. Representative Kinner. Aye. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Representative Schwartz? Aye. Representative Summers? Aye. Representative Walters? Aye. Senator Agar? Excused. Senator Garou? No. Senator Hicks? No. Senator Kinski? Senator Kinski, where are you? No. Co-Chairman Nicholas? Aye. Chairman Bebo? No. Mr. Chairman, there are seven ayes and four noes, one excused on the amendment. Okay, thank you for that. The amendment has passed. Are there any other amendments to the proposed bill out there that we now have we, we considered? Any other amendments? Okay, what I wanna, I want everybody to understand is uh, if we vote this in, as amended, and then we go back to the original situation, requires a majority vote of both as we move <coughs> forward. Is that correct, Anna? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. It would require a majority vote of both houses. Okay, uh, sensing where this might go, uh, let's take a, a short recess. And uh, Mr. Kocher, I wanna talk with you. So we'll stand in recess till the sound of the gavel.
All right, we'll call the committee back to order. Let's get everybody. We're getting there. Do we have a quorum on the screen? I believe we do. Yep, we do. We're waiting for the co-chair. There's Andy. There's Bob. Okay, uh, Mr. Co-chair, do you have a, a thought? Yeah, uh, Mr. Co-chair, uh, what I would suggest is that um, before we vote on this, let's, let's dwell on it and consider it over the lunch hour on what the impacts are if this bill goes down and if that's a real possibility. And, and we'll, uh, so I, I move that we table it till the end of the day on the vote on this particular issue. Okay, uh, that's, that's been seconded. We don't need to have a vote on that. It's been tabled till later on in the day. And uh, all right, let's get back to our schedule. Uh, we now go to that second bill we have, which is COVID related bill. And is Tamara gonna walk us through that bill? Is that how we're gonna do it? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Tamara Revlin, we can jump into that next bill draft. Okay, uh, give me a second Mr. here. Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a second. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, just a um, just a uh, a question on process to you. Um, you know, for co for public comment, I I may have somebody from my community doing public comment on this next bill, and we really didn't do any public comment on the last bill. I'm just wondering, so I can kind of relay back to my home folk. Um, wh where will public comment fall in on this next bill? Well, good point, Representative Summers, and I didn't mean to, to not have public comment. I didn't see any listed on the agenda, but if there's someone out there right now that would like to comment on this proposed CAPCON bill, we'll take that public testimony and then we'll also afford them an opportunity later on this afternoon when we bring it back up. So if there's someone out there now that's been waiting patiently, uh, let's have their comments now. Otherwise, I'll make a, just a formal announcement. We'll take public comment when we revisit the bill later today. Anybody out there wish to make any comments? Go ahead, Don. Mr. Chairman, you, you are correct. No individual has signed up to uh, provide public comment on the capital construction bill. I believe there are several folks in the audience, uh, Mel Muldrow, uh, Sandy Caldwell, Alex Keene, if any of they they ask to just uh, listen in if they uh, desire, but no one has signed up for public comment on the CAPCON bill. There are several who have signed up on the COVID bill. Well, what we'll do then, if it's all right with Representative Summers, is we'll let everybody be aware that we will take public comment later on when we bring this bill back up. And I would ask anyone that wants to do it, be prepared to do that. And uh, if that's okay with the committee, yeah, just a second. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that's fine. My, the person from my community is on this next bill, the COVID bill. So just uh, so you'll probably take public comment after we go through the bill before we make motions or kind of what is your process, Mr. Chairman? Well, yeah, Representative Summers, what we'll do like we've always done, there's no sense in taking comment after we voted on the bill. We'll work the bill and understand and then we'll take public comment excuse me, we'll go through the bill, take public comment, then work the bill. So we'll take public comment in there before we actually work the bill. I think that's the best way to do that. Go ahead, Senator Grew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a housekeeping point. I've got another meeting um, that I'm tracking and then I'm gonna have to present. So I'm gonna, if I ring off, I'll just, I'll be back as quick as I can. It won't be very long, but I just wanted to let you know if I go, I'm not leaving you for long, just a few, just a few minutes. And if you vote on something, hold it open for me. Well, Thanks. we will hold it open for you, but uh, we're gonna do the COVID bill next. So, okay, that's what we're gonna do. Any other questions of anybody? All right, let me, if everybody pulled up that bill, let me pull it up, Tamara, before you get started.
Mr. Chairman, the version is 21 LSO 0068 and it's working draft 0 0.5. Oh, okay, I'm getting to it. Let's go ahead and start. So you will all recall that at the last JAC meeting, a working group was created and members, Senator Bebout and Agar and representatives Nicholas and Senators were appointed to that working group. That group met once and worked the text of the bill. It was it began as a base from the capital construction bill. There was a provision in that bill at the last meeting related to grants for healthcare facilities. That language was the base of this bill and the working group added technology and broadband provisions as well as support for post-secondary institution. This bill generally appropriates CARES Act funds. So that 1.25 billion that was provided directly to the state and in several areas, it addresses rural healthcare entity grants, payments for UW, community colleges and post-secondary private institutions, telemedicine car in school districts, wireless internet access points at school districts, outdoor wireless points, and a reservation of future federal funds that might be received for last mile broadband. Those are the areas that are currently in the bill. So we'll jump in now to page one. In the bill title, we specify those four areas and also note that rulemaking is required, that appropriations are being provided, that the programs that are created are temporary and sunset dates are created and that an effective date is included. Section one is the Rural Healthcare Construction Program. And on page two, we have definitions. One thing new we've done with this bill is to define the CARES Act. And so every time we reference CARES Act, we reference back to that federal act as may be amended. That's in recognition that there could be amendments to the Federal CARES Act that might change some things. We define council because the Wyoming Business Council is going to administer this program, um, which is a change from the provision you saw at your last meeting. Uh, this bill would now be administered. The grant program for the rural health care entities would be administered by the Wyoming Business Council, subject to the approval of the governor. The next new thing we did in this bill is on page two lines 11 through 19, and I'll point this out here because we're gonna use this definition throughout the whole bill, is to define covered period. And by definition, it's going to mean the period beginning on the effective date of this act and ending December 30, 2020, except that if the Federal CARES Act is amended and we have a new date that's allowed, if they move it back to September or after the fiscal year of next year, as Don hinted was being considered in some legislation, then covered period ends on the last day of that period, which uh, the federal law allows for costs to be incurred. So I really wanna point out an important thing is that this is prospective. We define covered period for all purposes of this bill to mean prospectively on the effective date of this act. If you're looking to backfill some costs that were incurred, for example, grants to uh, healthcare entities, they stocked up on PPE in uh, June, then that would not necessarily be included. We might wanna define that covered period to begin on March 1st, 2020, as is allowed in the federal legislation. It's just up to you if you wanna be prospective on and after the effective date of this act, or if you wanna back date and allow for some reimbursement. For purposes of this program, we next define COVID-19 related expenses, and those are expenses incurred or will be incurred by an eligible entity in Wyoming um, due to the public health emergency caused by COVID-19. And we provide two examples on page three of those COVID-19 related expenses. The first is establishment of public medical facilities and other measures to increase COVID-19 treatment capacity or to improve mitigation measures, including related capital construction and B, for improvements to the state's healthcare delivery system and infrastructure to address COVID-19, including related construction costs. We also define eligible rural healthcare entity, and that's changed from the last time you saw this program. It now means any entity rather than facility that is licensed certified in the process of being licensed or certified, or which demonstrates intent to become licensed or certified upon project. And our question right there, <clears throat> when we talk about the infrastructure, that would be 
would that be reconditioning or refurbishing as well as new capital construction? That's my interpretation of that. Is that a correct? So where you have like a facility, I think an Alpine that's doing uh, some, some expanded uses, some of the existing rural health care facilities, maybe putting in COVID related rooms, so on and so forth, that would cover that, right? I, Mr. Chairman, I think that anything that would on line six improve mitigation measures or increase treatment capacity or is considered an improvement to the delivery system and infrastructure, then yes, I think that would be included. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Co-Chair. Go ahead, Bob. So going back to page two on, on the covered period, um, I'm curious, you had to use the word incurred and I presume that that incurred comes from the definition um, of the treasury that, that Don talked about and kind of quoted to us from the treasury language. But I'm wondering if it would be helpful if we added some additional language um, in case that definition is expanded. Um, and so, if we, and have incurred, contracted, or obligated um, to the extent that, that you come within compliance so that if there are ways that, that uh, as described by uh, Chairman Bebout, if, if, um, if it's contracted for, and so if you have a, a contract and you've spent all the contract because it's a performance-based contract, then, you know, that, I don't, I don't, doesn't make, it seems to me why to broaden that language and not be, in, in case Congress expands the language or does anything else, we need to be able to capture it. And as it's written here, I, I don't think it, we may not be able to capture that expansion. Does that make sense, Tamara? Yes, Mr. Ahead, Chairman. Mr. Co-Chairman. That is true. Right now, the law itself says costs must be incurred, but you're right. If they change the federal law to say costs shall be allowable, costs may include costs contracted, obligated, or otherwise set aside, then this language is somewhat limiting because we're still using that incurred term that's in the current law. And they might just change the definition of incurred through the guidance, but it's also possible that the law itself would be amended and that incurred term that's in the Federal CARES Act would be broadened. So that could be a good contingency to plan for. Yeah, good, good point, Mr. Co-Chair. And, and let's, act, let's keep that in mind if we get to the point of working this bill. Thank you, go ahead. I think we've went through the definitions. The meat of the program begins on page three, creating subsection B, creating the Rural Healthcare Entity Construction Program. And it's subject to final approval of the governor, as I mentioned earlier, but under the administration of the Wyoming Business Council. Council throughout means WBC. And it's created to uh, provide grants to eligible rural health care entities. The conditions on the grants are that they would only be rewarded, awarded upon application. They could only be made for COVID-19 related expenses that meet the following criteria. And then we restate the criteria of the current Federal CARES Act. And keep in mind that um, this bill, as opposed to some of the bills that were passed during special session, we are appropriating money to an entity and telling them to give it out further. So it's a little different than a direct appropriation. And we now know what the current criteria is and which pot of money we're using. We're talking about the 1.25 billion. And so in order to provide clear direction to the business council of what they need to look for in their grant applications, it restates the criteria of the Federal CARES Act. But if you have concern that that criteria is going to change, then it might be better to broaden this language. Yeah, and we might wanna do that. And Representative Summers, maybe we should have a little discussion with our full committee about uh, the, the reasoning behind why we wanted to have the business council. It wasn't I think it was in order to help facilitate uh, not taking away anything from what the slip board's doing. They're just just uh, overloaded with a bunch of with all the requests going on. And that's why we thought about the business council subject, of course, to the approval of the executive branch, that being the governor. Uh, Reverend Summers, you got anything to add to that? 
Um, Mr. Chairman, no, I think you you covered it. I I just think they've been handling a lot of this, a lot of these uh, issues, the business council, and and I think we just I, I just felt that that would be a simpler method. Okay, any questions by the, I see Representative Larson's hand going up. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Tamara, if I could go back to page three under uh, Romanet five, uh, and I don't know if this is you or maybe a member of the committee that could help me understand this. Down there on line 15, it says that, well, 14 or 15, we're talking about a rural healthcare entity that means any Wyoming entity licensed certified then it goes on to say, or in the process of being licensed or certified, then here's where my question comes in, or which demonstrates intent to become licensed or certified upon project completion. So that, to me, that leaves the door pretty wide open for anybody that says, uh, that wants to apply for uh, funding and say, well, but I'm gonna demonstrate that and and so my question is what does it take to demonstrate intent is there any criteria there and then um do we have a definition of a healthcare facility um is that a, is that a hospital is that at a an emergency care facility that just provides emergency stuff 24 hours a day or is it all of the above um can you guys give me some direction on that well, I can answer all that, but go ahead, Tamara. Well, please fill in, Mr. Chairman, if I missed something. There is no criteria, there's no definition of what demonstrating intent would mean. So it would have to be to the satisfaction of the business council and subject to the approval of the governor. So you're right, it is an entity that um, is not yet built or perhaps not yet complete or doesn't provide this particular service as a healthcare facility. Uh, the use of the term healthcare facility there on line 17 is modeled after existing Wyoming statute. And it's a facility that normally provides 24 hour care um, to individuals, including the entity's owner, operator, or licensee that is taken out of our healthcare statutes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna to add to that. Oh. I'm gonna to add to that too, Representative Larson, is that when we looked at this, we were, we were specifically talking about four specific areas. We talked about construction in our state, that being of course, Riverton. Also, it included uh, Saratoga, it included Pinedale, and in the northeastern part of our state. And we weren't sure, and I'm still not sure if what, what phase there are in, in terms of that. So we went with a broad definition to be sure it was inclusive rather than exclusive, and we didn't want to leave anyone out. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and, and Rep Representative Larson. Um, the, the one reason on, and, and some of it's maybe our lack of understanding, and you probably have a little more, but I know in our deliberations locally on a hospital, you, you kind of have to build the hospital and then you get certified and, and approved. Um, obviously you build according to standards that, that allow that to happen. But, um, and maybe I'm wrong here, uh, Representative Larson, but isn't it true you kind of, you have to have an application after you have your hospital constructed before you get plumb approval for that. So it's kind of a touchy issue. Well, I, I don't argue that. I'm just, I'm, I'm Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Reverend Larson. I, I don't argue that. I'm just trying to understand the language. I, I think with that language, it is certainly, in, it is inclusive. And I, and I just wonder if it isn't broader than, than what you, are intended to be the good chairman talks about four areas, but I think that it certainly opens it up to um, much broader than that. My uh, Tamara question to you: Could a long-term care facility, a skilled nursing facility, uh, is, is that is that its own beast, or could that be considered a healthcare facility as well? Go ahead, Tamara. I think the healthcare facility is broader of those uh, definitions you mentioned or terms you mentioned would be inclusive of those types of facilities, at least as intended. So, so with that, you could have a, um, a community or a hospital district or anything else that was desirous to build a, a skilled nursing facility and could qualify likewise similar to uh, perhaps a hospital. 
Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, I believe so. I believe that if it can be licensed by the department at this, as a healthcare facility that provides skilled care, that would be inclusive. Just trying to understand, thank you. Yeah, and the other thing it certainly includes would be clinics as well. Is that not correct, Tamara? Mr. Chairman, it has to meet that definition right now of providing 24 hour per day care for individuals. And so I don't know if so, all clinics yeah. do that. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. So that was that was my question because um, I know that there are clinics around in the rural counties that are not open 24 hours a day. You know, they, they can open up on an emergency basis um, if someone's available or is on call, but that they're not open. And so um, for example, I think that's the, that used to be the circumstance in Saratoga. Um, and I would think that uh, there are other clinics are similar, that they're not quote unquote open 24 hours a day, um, only when uh, called upon. And I'm just wondering if that, is that something we ought to, uh, to modify here or, have, or think about because um, we, we may be shutting the door on those clinics that, that are, are not totally open 24 hours a day the way this is worded. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's a good point, Mr. Co-Chair. And I think recently the uh, SLID board actually approved uh, an application for a clinic to receive funds. And that happened to be Shoshone, which certainly will not be a 24 hour facility, yet that's outside what we're talking about here. So we may need to work on that definition. Go ahead, Representative Larson, you had your hand up. Thank okay. you. Okay. I think you answered it, thank you. Okay, uh, good points. Uh, continue, Tamara. I think we are at the end of page, say four, beginning of page five. So mentioned that the criteria that's in the current Federal CARES Act was restated there um, in subparagraphs A, B, and C. And we talk about though on page five, line five, the costs need to be incurred by an eligible rural health care entity or will be incurred during the covered period. And that means after this legislation is passed, after the effective date, through whatever that last day that is allowable by federal law. So just that perspective looking period is what's used in this bill. I've got well, a staff the comment thing, there. Yeah, the other thing, and I appreciate that staff commentary. We've been talking about that since the get go, but. If we modify per what Mr. Co-Chair brought up in that one section of the definitions, that gives us a little wiggle room there too. So go ahead. I think we kind of already discussed. Larson, Representative Larson's got his hand up. Go ahead, Representative Larson. Thank you. And I just want to, Tim, I want to make sure because I think you alluded to this earlier on page four on line 19, the, the use of the, the word incurred in this section relates back to the conversation we had in the other section, because this is this is past tense, and it would have to say that the entity applying for these grants would have to have had some pre-existing history in delivering health care to qualify for the construction grant, unless we qualify the language. Is that fair? Well, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, let me. We do allow for costs that will be incurred. By definition, we say those are COVID-19 related expenses in uh, the prior pages. Here, we're just restating the federal criteria, means costs incurred and then moving on during the cover period. And so that does not necessarily mean, at least it wasn't intended, just like the Federal CARES Act allows you to pass along funds for future costs that you're, you know, you're getting applications for. It doesn't mean it's only on a reimbursement basis. It can include costs that will be incurred during the cover period. But they're COVID related costs. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So, so then the question would come, if there is not a facility, whether it be a clinic or a hospital, if they, don't exist today, then we have to answer the question is how the establishment of them by construction is a COVID related cost. Is 
that right? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, the Business Council and the Governor would have to make, and I think the Treasury Act guidance uses the term, a reasonable determination that this expenditure is a necessary expenditure in response to COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, let's continue. I think we have questions. We do. Oh, Mr. Co-Chair, go ahead. Thank you. So with this language, I, I think we have a similar issue. It seems to me that we would want to either strike this, this section and just say com, com, that you just need to be compliant with the COVID CARES Act as is as exist or as amended in the future um, and allow the greatest extent of, of flexibility possible in order to conform with the intent of the act, something to that effect. Um, because once this is passed, we're not gonna be able to easily go in and modify it. And this is, so this, this kind of ties us to the track of the current treasury guidelines. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's our intent with this. So, because under the current treasury guidelines, most people would say that these projects won't fit, that won't fit within the, um, those guidelines. And understanding that as a possibility, we want to have the language as broad as possible to encapsulate any changes that may come um, in, in Congress that, or what happens after um, this becomes law, if it becomes law in a special session, so. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point too, Mr. Co-Chair. The, the question I would have, Tamara, is <clears throat> this is in the section dealing with rural hospitals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, would this be something we would have to do when we talk about the, uh, the, the funding for the community college, university, whatever else we might do, broadband, would they also require similar amendments? With, and so we, we, we're sure we comply with however the law turns out, with whatever Congress might do to it. Would that be correct, Tamara? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. You would probably want to make some conforming changes right now. We define CARES Act to mean the same thing, which means as amended, but there are some of those deadlines and um, some criteria that we would want to be consistent with throughout the whole bill. Yeah, I think that's why I'd like to approach it if the committee was so inclined to support that kind of an amendment do we make it inclusive to include everything rather than just deal with rural hospitals? Because clearly we'll be at the mercy of the feds on whatever they may or may not do. Representative Larson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a bit of information I received from a technological bird that whispered in my ear um, that clinic, clinics do not need to be licensed. They'll be licensed by the parent operating entity, which is a hospital or something. So. Uh, is we can sort of yeah, let me yeah, hold on a sec. We'll wait for send there we go. <laughs> so, uh, just to, to make sure that we're clear on that, if we were putting a clinic in some place, it'd be operated under the license of the hospital someplace or 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 someplace else, but they don't require licensing, is what I was told. Good source, too, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so what you're saying is the uh, go ahead, Reverend Schwartz. No, go ahead and, and respond to Representative Larson first. I'll wait. Well, what I'm saying then, of course, the medical clinics, and I think we need to, maybe we could get that definition clearly outlined so we understand it, Tamara, from uh, let's talk with the Department of Health and get a clarification. I'm sure Representative Larson's correct. Let's just document that and get it out to us so we totally understand that. And uh, maybe if they're listening in, they could shoot that to us in the meantime. Now, go ahead, Reverend Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in the staff comment, there's a reference to recoupment that if we, it is determined by the federal government that the expenditures were not COVID related, the state's on the hook. Um, and I, I have pretty, I mean, I have concerns about whether or not we can substantiate the construction of a hospital. All of that would be considered COVID related. Or when the state's on the hook, does that mean, I mean, I know we have to pay. We then have the capacity to try and get a hospital district or whatever to pay back the state, but there's no guarantee of that. Is that correct? 
ultimately it's just on the state. Well, I'm not sure that that would be totally correct. I Maybe Tamara could give an interpretation. What we try to put in there is that every local facility that might require some of these COVID funds has skin in the game. And in the way I would look at it, my interpretation would be that skin in the game would cover any COVID related funds. There's no way that you can justify like in Riverton's situation, $38 million of COVID funds to build that hospital. That'll never fly. All we're talking about in Riverton's case is a COVID related funds to what we actually have to do to our plans that are already in place, ready to go to make it a COVID related facility relative to the, what we see now going on. That would be my response. Go ahead, Reverend Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, and, and I think Tamara will cover it, but to the answer to that question, it, it explicitly states in this, in the bill here that uh, other state funds will not go into this. So, and I think Tamara will elaborate on that, but it does not put the, it does not put the state on the hook for the bill. Good point, Representative Schwartz. Uh, go ahead, Tamara. Yes, we will get to that on page seven a little bit. This is the only source of funds that can be used to pay, uh, to make these grants. But once the grants go out, uh, they're to be used as is provided in the section. And this section allows for permanent capital construction. If the um, Office of the Inspector General and the Treasury Department later decide that that was not an allowable use and there's no amendments to federal law that explicitly change that, then it would be the state that was on, be on the hook for recoupment. Either we wouldn't receive federal funds that we should be due, it would be a debt to the state. And that money has already gone out and been expended as a grant by the receiving facility. Now, if the facility expends it out of compliance with this section, meaning they do something completely as a bad actor would do, um, completely not allowable in their grant terms or allowable in the section, they use it to go on vacation, et cetera, something like that, then they would have to repay all the funds. But if it's something we've allowed for in this section and it later de is determined not to be allowed, then that is uh, at least stated by federal law to be booked as a debt to the state. And we'll get to that provision on page seven. Okay, let's continue. Okay. I won't belabor the staff comment too much. I think we've discussed that earlier by Don. One thing I do wanna mention as we um, talk about making the act more broad to incorporate any kind of changes that could happen to federal law is that we have taken out the attorney general's review, that layer of written review on the legality. And that was included in some of the special session legislation. I think because of all these contingencies, we wanted a legal entity to provide a written determination of what the federal law might be amended, what it might allow, all these types of contingencies. And so when we remove that layer of review, that specific layer of review, we're left with just the business council and the governor um, having to follow all of the changes to federal law and keep up with them and make sure that the laws and the expenditures are in compliance. And I'm certain that they would probably still rely on their attorney general. It's just, we no longer mandate that written review, which means you might not be able to see that review because it might be um, client advice between the attorney general and the governor or the business council. Well, but one other thing too, Tamara, is we took out there that the attorney general had a veto over it if they didn't think it complied with their interpretation that they could veto. And what we're saying is we don't mind them giving us an idea or opining on their opinion. You know, the decision rests in the business council, the governor, the legislature. I mean, uh, I, under, I appreciate attorneys reviews and tell us our exposure, but we make the decision. We don't have veto power coming from the AG's office. And that's what we try to accomplish. And I think by doing what we've done, we have taken care of that. Like you said, certainly doesn't prohibit the AG that's in the business council reviewing it or the governor going to the AG and asking their opinion. It's just that the governor and the business council make that decision, not have the attorney general have veto power. Go ahead. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Chairman. We'll jump on past the staff comment to page six and continue through the rest of the criteria for these grants to rural healthcare entities. They need to be conditioned upon the entity demonstrating that it will have or has costs incurred, um, COVID-19 related expenses that are reimbursable by the grants. Then 
Each grant is to not exceed $20 million to any entity or 75 or and 75% of the total costs of the eligible rural health care entities COVID-19 related expenses included in the entity's grant application. And so that's intended to be the total project cost. It's just not all of these grant applications are going to be for projects. They might be for their COVID-19 related expenses. So it's set up to say, ask for 100%, but um, understand that only 75% is the max that will be granted. And later we mentioned that they need to bring in a 25% match. The grants shall only be provided with funds uh, provided to the state government of Wyoming under the CARES Act, that 1.25 billion, and no other funds of any kind shall be expended to pay grants. So once the grants are paid, it's only with that CARES fund and no other state funds will supplement the grants. Finally, on page seven, the uh, criteria is subject to federal law. The healthcare entity would need to maintain a meaningful nexus to the state of Wyoming for three years, at least, comply with reporting requirements established by the Wyoming Business Council that's sufficient to satisfy the federal requirements on the state, and repay all funds. This is that subsection C we just talked about, uh, subparagraph C on lines 12 through 14, repay all funds provided if the grant is used for expenses not authorized by this section. And then subparagraph so D, provide at least 25% of the total cost of the eligible rural healthcare entities COVID-19 related expenses that they've applied for in matching funds, including cash, donations, or in-kind support. On page eight, we ask the council to, do you have a question? I don't have my full screen on. Does someone have a question? Yes, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, go Mark Kinner. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can someone help me with the section on the nexus? Is that something that we normally do uh, for a three year period or is that, can someone talk about that a little bit for me, please? Go ahead, Tamara. So I wasn't part of the discussion that included this language originally. Uh, but it is something that is often provided to show consideration when we're granting state funds to a private entity and asking that there be adequate consideration. We want to see economic development in the state or a return to the state. I do think that a variation of this is also provided in many of the other committees, bill drafts that allocate funds or provide grant funds to business entities, that there be some kind of a nexus, although I think they have various grant programs throughout the legislative committees are wording the section a little bit differently. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions on this? Okay, please continue. On um, continuing on. I saw his hand go up. Go ahead. So um, on page seven line uh, in subsection C, it says repay all funds provided under this section if the eligible rural health care provider uses grant funds for expenses not authorized by this section. Um, it would make more sense that they have to repay those funds that are not authorized, but not repay all the funds. So that that's kind, it's kind of couched in the, um, does that make sense, Tamara? Go ahead, Tamara. I think Mr. Chairman, Mr. Go Chairman, you would like them to repay all funds used for expenses not authorized, not repay 100% of the grant if there's one right. area that's out of compliance. Right. Yeah, I, I see that and, and it's, it makes sense that it should be only what they spent, not what's authorized. That makes good sense. Okay, continue. We'll continue on, on page eight. We ask for the business council to promulgate necessary rules. We mentioned that no expenditure of funds shall be made except in accordance with state and federal laws, regulations, and orders. Um, we next allow for random audits of the entities that receive grant funds and mention that the entire program sunsets 
or terminates on the last day of the covered period. And Finally, that, said, that would include, uh, if the Senate version were to work, that would be September 28th rather than December 30th, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure on that exact day, but yes, September. Okay, thanks, go ahead. Uh, subsection G is the reappropriation of funds and all of the bill uh, appropriations in this bill kind of model this reappropriation language. And it is kind of wordy, but we'll go through it real quick and then maybe brush over it in the next times it's mentioned. We're reappropriating to the council from the funds that were provided to the state government, that 1.25 billion in particular, under the section 601 of the Federal Social Security Act as amended by the CARES Act, which we had already appropriated to the office of the governor in the special session. So reappropriating those funds um, that were made available for expenditure on any of the three uh, periods or tranches. So if you remember right, the special session laws, um, tranche those out into three periods. So any of those funds that were appropriated during those three would be reappropriated for this new purpose. And the first on page nine is $75 million specifically earmarked for this program for COVID-19 related expenses of capital construction, which includes infrastructure and major maintenance of public medical facilities. The second is generally 175 million for any allowable COVID-19 grants. But again, an entity can only receive a maximum of 20 million under this program. So they can't receive 20 million in CapCon and 20 more million in general expenses. You know, and just to comment on that, two members of the committee. You know, we had some discussion about that, whether we should specifically say 75 million for, you know, what we consider construction, refurbishing, reconditioning, expansion of to have COVID related rooms or to, to simply have one pot of money to be all inclusive and we decided to separate it out, not saying that's the best way to go. So that's that's uh, the purpose and why we did that. Of course, the 175 would be available to uh, all the other rural health care facilities in Wyoming to, to do COVID related expenses, the zero pressure rooms, whatever they might decide to do, more ICUs related to COVID and all of that. And that's why we broke it out. And uh, Ms. Brepton Summers, am I missing anything there? No, nope, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Reverend Walters, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, based on that comment you just made, the money being available to all rural hospitals around the state, is every hospital in the state considered a rural hospital due to Wyoming's entire rural nature? Mr. Chairman? The chairman seems to be froze up. Well, I think and I can take that if you'd like for Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, suggest Tamara take it. I don't think we defined rural. That's right. We, we use the term rural hospitals as a um, name of the program and name of the entity, but there's no criteria that populations be under a certain amount or serving a certain area of the state. It's any entity in Wyoming. And, and I think that there is some discussion the Federal CARES Act guidance about service for rural entities in general and Wyoming is by nature rural compared to the rest of the states that are receiving CARES Act guidance. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chairman, shall I proceed with the bill absent the chairman's presence? Okay. I'll continue on. The last provision of subsection H on page nine is standard language that we're using throughout this bill for the appropriation, some conditions on that. And it just says that if there's a COVID-19 relief account, which there is created, we're going to use the that account to make the funds and that the funds shall generally not be transferred or expended for any other purpose except for making the grants that are authorized by this act, except that we have a sweep. And the date that I've put in here for the sweep is October 15th. Um, we'd ask the council to estimate the amount of money that needs to go out for this program 
on or before October 15th. And on that date, the funds would then, or whenever they estimate that amount, the funds would be reappropriated to the office of the governor. So if we've over-appropriated funds here, uh, we don't wanna lock that money down such that it couldn't be used for the other expenses. So it would be swept back to the office of the governor for the items that were appropriated for in the special session laws. And that date here is October 15th. That will be dependent upon how much time is needed to implement this program and um, when a special session might happen. So that is highlighted, I think, throughout the bill to make sure that we get that date right based on what you think appropriate timing would be. Yeah, and I had an interruption on in my internet service again. Did the representative Walters get his question answered? Are you hearing me, Tamara? Yes, I believe so, Mr. Chairman. He did get it answered, okay. All right, continue. We do have questions, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Go I ahead, have a Mr. question on the, on the 75 million and the 175 million. I have two questions. One, um, are we doing any limiting factors on amounts to any um, going to one particular facility or is it kind of a carte blanche? And two, um, do we do any offset for other funds that they receive from other COVID dollars? So for example, if they receive 30 or 40 million for, for um, COVID related expenses, is there an offset or is that gonna be considered by the, the council in, in the application? I just wonder if, if how we cross pollinate on those issues. Well, I can answer that. I don't believe there's anything that relates to previous or other funds are utilized, something we could consider. And then of course, whether it's the 75 million or the 175, their limitations are no more than 20 million to any institution. Would that be correct, Tamara? Yes, both correct points. Any follow-up there, Mr. Co-Chair? Okay, let's continue. I don't need I don't see where the the 20 million and the 75 and the 175 are tied in directly but the way this is worded. So Tamara, can you show me that language? Yes, yeah, so the maximum amount that's allowable is on page six, line eight and nine. A grant uh, shall be in an amount not to exceed 20 million to any eligible rural healthcare entity. And so it's not restated in the appropriation section, which just serves to carve off 75 million for capital construction expenses. But if um, the committee would like a more explicit statement of no entity under any circumstances receiving more than 20 million, we can work on that language. Okay, let's continue. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson's got a question. Representative Larson, I see your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tamara, my question on G on page eight, where we talk about the reappropriation from the, the bill we passed in the special session on section 2B and section 2CI through III. Um, by taking that money now and reappropriating it, does it conflict at all with, have, have, with appropriations that are being made under those sections or are those funds available? Uncommitted, I should say. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, that's a good question. I think it's a bit of a question of timing and realistically where the funds are at. The session law as of September 15th, I believe, releases all funding to the office of the governor. And so it's entirely possible that under the authority granted on that law on that date or the next day, all of the funding is committed. We do make the funding, we allow it to be expended on future legislative acts that relate to COVID-19 and this would be that but I think it's a question of timing if the money is all obligated on September 16th and this bill is not passed until October 1st or some other day, you may have issues there. 
So follow up, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. So this just talks about a reappropriation. It doesn't make reference there to anything that's already obligated. It just says thou shalt take this money from those two places and reappropriate it to this act. And so even if the even if it went back to the governor, we're saying that this money would be reappropriated for this cause. So two questions. Am I correct in that observation? And if so, does it conflict again? Is there the potential that taking that, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul or is we, um, are we taking from one commitment and in, in putting it to another? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I think you raise a point that that is, I believe technically a possibility. And sometimes when we have this possibility and we're reappropriating funds, we say subject to the availability of funds. And so that could be an amendment that you consider. Otherwise it just becomes a question of if the money is already paid and obligated and expended, then the state cannot impair those prior contracts and take that money back for this purpose. In reality, it could only expend the amounts, but it is better language to say subject to the availability of funds to ensure that the legislature is not trying to impair those prior contracts or obligations that are created. I think that we didn't anticipate that all of the money would be obligated by the time this bill was passed. But as we talk about timing and we'll learn from the governor's presentation soon, that might be a reality that needs to be talked about and considered. So well, it's a the reality because the uh, SLED the other day approved, I think like 40 or 45 million for various entities, various rural health care facilities related to COVID. Most of it was HVAC, but that, that's certainly out there, Tamron, we can talk about that. Representative Larson, did you have another comment? Yeah, and well, it's a question, I guess, back to, to, to you guys on the committee. Was it your intent to say thou shall move this money or was it conditioned upon availability? Well, for me, it was shall. That's what I was trying to figure out. Thank you. Go ahead, Reverend Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, I guess, I think from my perspective, I, I figured it would be that it was unobligated. So I probably had a different view of it. That was my opinion. That it shall be you know, reappropriated if it isn't obligated. Um, so that would have been my intent. I think in the big scheme of things, either way, it probably will work if it's not there, whether we say shall or not, it won't happen. We could sure change that or modify if we so choose, chose to do. Anything else uh, on this particular section from anybody? What I'd like to do, good comments, good questions. Tamara, the next section deals into the university and the community colleges, right? So yes. before we get into that committee, are there any other questions on section one relative to rural hospitals and what we're trying to accomplish here? Any other committees discussion? Any other committee discussion? I see Senator Guru is back just in time for a break. Timing is everything. So members of the committee, uh, let's take a 15 minute pause and we'll come back and we'll start on section two. Thank you, 15 minutes.
Anyone out there hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let's uh, call the meeting to order, back to order. I see everyone's picture up there except mine. Is that something that the co-chairman took care of during the little break? To... So no, can you guys see me? No, sir. No, no. All right. I'm not sure what's going on here, but anyway, uh, wait a minute. There we go. There you are. Okay, let's call the uh, meeting back to order. And Tamara, I believe we're on section two. Before we get to section two, did anyone have any last minute thoughts or questions on section one? Once again, I thought there were a lot of good comments and Tamara, when we work that bill, we'll, we'll sure try to incorporate those and get a good consistent message and bill out there, try to help our rural hospitals. Okay, section two, let's get started. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, section two relates to support for higher education for post-secondary education. And this text of this bill draft, the base came from the Tomorrow's Task Force. They had a bill draft and the working group took that language and made some technical amendments as well as a few um, policy changes and incorporated that into this bill. And that bill, if you were watching the Tomorrow's Task Force or following along with what happened there, that bill was amended during their last meeting. And so this version includes all of the amendments approved by the chairs of that task force. Oh, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, you got something? No, go ahead. All right, go ahead, Tamara. All right. No. Generally, what this bill does is it provides payments to students at UW community colleges and uh, post-secondary, private post-secondary institutions under the terms of the section. So we have definitions again, beginning on page 10, definition of CARES Act and definitions on page 11. Commission is the community college commission who's going to administer this for the community colleges. Covered period is as we discussed earlier, the same definition from section one. COVID-19 safety procedures on page 11 lines 14 through 17 are the policies and procedures that a student must follow to get payments under this program. They're the policies and procedures mandated by an eligible institution of an eligible student to mitigate the spread of the novel coronavirus caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Department for purposes of this section is the Department of Workforce Services to connect to those private post-secondary institutions. An eligible institution on page 12 is UW, a Wyoming Community Colleges, or an accredited private post-secondary educational institution. An eligible student is a United States citizen or a permanent resident alien who meets the definition of an eligible non-citizen under Title IV of the Federal Higher Education Act of 1965 as amended or requirements of a subsequent familiar federal enactment who is enrolled in an eligible institution either full-time or part-time for the 2021 through 2022 academic year. So not just the fall, the full year. And one note on that definition of a permanent resident alien, um, that change was approved by the chairman of the Tomorrow's Task Force to be consistent with the Wyoming Works Program and the Hathaway Scholarship. And these students are students who are eligible for federal aid under federal law. These are not undocumented immigrants or um, international students, they're permanent residents, I think something like a green card holder. So that was an approved change by the chairman. We do have a staff comment there on page 12 that the working group talked about whether this program could be used to really target um, the issue of decreased enrollments that is occurring at the universities. And if staff had any suggestions as to how to do that, to add some staff comments. And so that staff comment has been added is that one option would be to define an eligible student as someone who enrolls on or after the effective day to try to bring in heightened or new enrollment. Um, just a policy suggestion there. Let's, I'm sure there's other ways to accomplish that as well. Let's stop right there for a second committee. And, and, and here's, a, here's a question that I would have and that 
Representative Summers and I talked about at length is uh, you know, there's no question, at least from my support of doing this, I believe Representative Summers would agree we want to support this. The concern we had is how do you differentiate or that incremental difference in terms of students that would not go versus those that are already going. And then also, and we have a further provision in there, they also, this would be the, the funding of last resort considering they may have a lot of other scholarships available, but how do we ensure that it, it's like at the university, you know, I think the pre-enrollment number now, maybe we have that, it's available to us. It's around 11,000 and the COVID issues and stuff that, that comes up, it hasn't really decreased the 15 or 20% we've heard about so what, what is the real enrollment that's declined it was because of COVID and how do we get that incremental differences to ensure the money goes to an area to the students that would otherwise not go to that school to help with the enrollment decrease? Go ahead, Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess my question back to you and, and Representative Summers or those that are on the committee. So th through the administration of this, the, the, the funds would go to the institution and not directly to the student, I would assume. And so then um, there can be an accounting, I would also assume at the, because at a community college, they, they have a tendency to enroll at last minute or they may withdraw at the last minute. And so then you could, you may have already made an accounting or made an appropriation from the workforce services to the institution, but then is there a, then you could allow for a follow-up audit to determine if the person actually attended. If they did, great, the institution gets that, has that money, and if not, then they would revert it. Is that kind of what your thinking is? Well, I mean, that's a discussion we had, Representative Larson. I'm not sure. I think we've got provisions in there that, it, you know, there's not a drop dead date that things come in right at the last minute would be inclusive. And we would cover those. There again, it's that incremental increase. Yeah. You look at like any one of the colleges and their FTEs last year were blank. And this year they're the same number within one or two percentage points. What do we do? Go ahead, Representative Summers. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think um, Representative Larson, you raise a good point. I was I, I thought we had conditions in here that 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 had to that student had to maintain certain certain criteria to remain eligible for the for the dollars now I, i'm not positive that i can't remember but that was in i know in our discussion in wyoming's tomorrow that was there um the challenge we had in wyoming's tomorrow and why we made it so broad is the very topic that uh chairman bebout and i were talking about is how do you get to that incremental if you don't give it to to all students how can you really get to that piece and uh, and so in the end, in Wyoming's tomorrow, we we didn't solve that. We left it broader, fuller, um, um, to try to. And and frankly, in the end, it was felt that it probably was as much as anything family support. Um, so it would help in the end. It wouldn't matter who that student was. It would help with family support. But Tamara, don't we have some conditions that you have to do certain things to maintain the uh, to actually maintain the scholarship? Mr. Chairman, yes, and I think we'll go through those if you would like me to point them out as we work the bill or listen to the bill. Yeah, let's do it when we get to that part of the bill. And, uh, and, and that's a real policy decision committee that we have to make is in assuming, the, you know, pick any one of the institutions that the enrollment really hasn't changed yet, we're going to provide additional funds for those students that are already enrolled and would have been so regardless of COVID. And, and that's that's really the issue and how you really get to that point. And, and uh, we, we didn't solve that problem either. We made some progress. One of the big things we did is I think we took the money from going to the student, it would go to the institutions. And I think that, that helped, that was different than Wyoming tomorrow possibly. Go ahead, Reverend Larson. <laughs> Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, uh, those private institutions, uh, like the technical institution over in Laramie and this the four-year private institution here in Lander, uh, would that be administered through workforce services or, or through to to administer that for them, or does that go through the uh, the community college commission? Go ahead, Tamara. 
Mr. Chairman, that is administered through the Department of Workforce Services. And so those institutions would make those applications through Workforce Services, correct, Mr. Chairman? I believe that's correct. Go ahead, uh, Representative Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While we're on these private institutions, I'm just curious, how many are there in the state and what's their enrollment, do we know? Well, I know we have one in the, the, the uh, Wyoming Catholic College. And I think uh, maybe Representative Larson knows that number. And I'm not sure of anything else. Representative Summers, can you shine some light on that? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think we got a memo that's in our meeting materials that lists a whole set of uh, institutions, which is a much larger set of institutions <laughs> than I knew about. But I think, uh, I think we have that <clears throat> information in our meeting materials. Okay. Some of us didn't get through all the information, including me. So good, good point, Representative Summers. All right, let's go ahead and proceed. Great. I think we're through definitions. The university, of course, is the University of Wyoming. The program is created in subsection B on page 12. It's called the No COVID-19 on Campus Wyoming Program. And it's to be administered jointly by the department, the commission and the university. It's a temporary program for eligible students attending a private post-secondary educational institution or um, UW or community college. It is, uh, it, it is through payments to the students and the program and payments are administered in accordance with the following. And we have criteria beginning on page 13. So an eligible student at UW could receive a maximum amount of $6,500 and that's, or they receive that payment this year, they receive it for um, the entire period that they're, they get it. But it comes in a, a lump sum, at least that's how it's contemplated by this bill. And part-time students would be eligible to receive a prorated amount based on credit hours attempted at community colleges or an accredited private post-secondary institution, which we ha do have quite a long list of those from the Department of Workforce Services would be eligible to receive a maximum amount of 4,200. And part-time students would be subject to that prorating as well. The provision that I think tried to capture only students enrolled, although it's not a exact look back as was just contemplated, but that provision is on four, page 14 lines four through seven, and that payments are dispersed within five business days after the eligible institution final course drop date for the 2020 fall semester. So again, it doesn't try to get into the 2021 spring semester, but at least tries to make sure students are um, still enrolled as of the drop date and money is not passed out until that day has passed. The payments under the section could be used towards the cost of attendance. So that includes tuition, fees, room and board, books and supplies, travel expenses, and here's the provision that says it needs to be the last dollar in. It begins on lines 13 and ends on line 20. And that's that this payment, if it's going to, when combined with any other type of aid, if it's going to exceed the cost of attendance at the institution, then the payment needs to be reduced under this section um, by an amount necessary to not exceed that cost of attendance. Payments would only be provided to eligible students who have been, oh, we do have a question here. Yeah, th what that says, Tamara, and I think you explained it very well. So if a, if a particular student, regardless of whether they were incremental or not, had, a, had Hathaway, had some other private, uh, different kinds of support, that would be netted out against the 6,500. That's what that language will do, correct? You're nodding your head. That's I right. I see Senator Coe has joined us. So Senator Coe, good to see your smiling face this morning. Uh, if any time during the, when we have public comments or anything you wanna check, feel free to, to jump on. Okay, we have Representative Walters and Senator Hicks. Go ahead, Representative Walters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that section, uh, just for discussion's sake, would we want that dollar to be the first dollar in so that we could save our Hathaway dollars and spend the federal dollars uh, 
versus Hathaway scholarship dollars to, to maintain a robust Hathaway scholarship program uh, two or three years from now. And as I say, I, I offer that as, as consideration and discussion. I certainly understand how it's written currently. Well, and I, and thinking about that, I, I would love to do that. I think that might get into the, the prohibition of, of existing costs that would be allocated to our universities, but all up in the air. And if we legitimately could offset that and still accomplish what we want, why wouldn't we do that? So good point. Senator Hicks. Mr. Chairman, a question is, is, I'm trying to work through the practical application of this. So I'm still not clear whether the money goes to the student or the institution. I thought I heard it goes to the institution. But under that case, then we look at the eligible expenditures uh, on page 14, line 12, and, and it includes personal expense, travel expense. How is an institution going to know what your personal expenses is? And quite frankly, I'm not exactly sure what that, that would cover personal expenses. Uh, anyway, how are they going to be able to document those? And then are they going to then reimburse the the individual. So I'm just trying to understand the mechanics of how the university or a community college is going to reimburse part of a scholarship to an individual for their personal expenses. And maybe Tamara can walk me through that. How is that going to work? Go ahead, Tamara. Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, the appropriation of funds in the later section of this section are to the University Department of Workforce Services and Community Colleges. They get, they receive the chunk of money. The applications then need to be made by students to each of those institutions for the maximum amount. And the maximum amount I think would be allocated of $6,500 or $4,200 to each student, except that those students who have other aid, um, those amounts would be reduced. So it's a student upon application to the eligible institution. The full amount is just re, uh, released to the student and the student is to use it for those items. Uh, there's no accounting to see that they were used for those items. It's um, just required, I think, in the kind of paperwork that would accompany the release of those funds. So Mr. Chairman, if I'll follow up on just a follow up there. And so then the next provision in, in that section, it talks about attendance costs. So, so who makes the determination when we come to equitable distribution of these funds on attendance costs? Is that each institution determines what attendance costs are and are personal expenses part of attendance costs? I'm trying to figure that one out. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I might not be the best person to speak on this, but I think cost of attendance is a term of art used in the financial aid world. And I, I bet we have some experts that could comment on this. Cost of attendance is that term of art and it includes tuition fees, room and board books and its supplies, travel expenses and per personal expenses related to attending that institution. And so this is a term that's used and allowable expenses are allowed under other types of financial aid. It's that estimate of what it would cost for a person to attend the University of Wyoming or community college. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, and I understand that the work of art, the attendance cost is gonna be whatever that tuition and fees are for that institution. But I'm still trying to figure the way the payment under this section shall be reduced by the amount necessary not to not exceed that cost of attendance. But yet, if you go back up, on line uh, 12, we said, but personal expenses expenses can be paid for out of this. So it, it looks to me like there's a conflict there saying, well, it's not to exceed what attendance costs are, but we're gonna pay personal expenses, travel expenses uh, for these students. So I'm, I'm just trying to rectify if, if these two sections are consistent or whether they're competing and how the heck would you administer it if it stands the way it is right now? Go ahead, Tamara. 
I think that perhaps it could be defined to say cost of attendance means and then list those out. I believe that's what the drafters, um, when they pulled in this language and this list of expenses, those are all considered to be in that figure of cost of attendance. And, and so they're not supposed to be mutually exclusive cost of attendance includes personal expenses. But if that's not clear enough, we could define that or try to um, clarify on this legislation. And maybe the institutions that uh, would administer this would want to comment on how they view personal expenses under their programs. Well, I think- yeah, Mr. We'll, Co-Chair, we've got- language Sandy we, came on the screen and maybe Sandy can tell us what that term of art is. Yeah, before we do, Mr. Co-Chair, is this the language, Tamara, that we use from the Wyoming Tomorrow? Uh, pretty much their standard language. Is this what we use? Maybe a member of that committee might comment on this, then we can get to Sandy. Is this the language we took from that bill? Go ahead, Representative Summers. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I, Tamara, I think it is. I was going to answer. I, I think that comes from the Wyoming's Tomorrow. Is that correct or not? Mr. Chairman, I believe that this came in as an amendment to the Wyoming's Tomorrow Task Force Bill. So when they looked at it, I'm not sure the exact terminology was included, but it was, I think, conceptually amended in. So LSO drafters then uh, looked to definitions and recreated what they thought the committee was intending with that amendment. And so just to follow up, Mr. Chairman, I think the idea was to capture all of those those expenses. I, I do agree with Senator Hicks. I think you got to nail that down maybe a little better. And maybe uh, maybe Sandy has some, some insight on that. I too agree with Senator Hicks. I think that's uh, something that I, we got to be careful of. Sandy, I see you popping up on my screen. Would you care to comment on this? Welcome. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, uh, Ms. Ravalli is correct. This is a term of art. A total cost of attendance. For the record, please. Oh, I apologize for that. I'm Sandy Caldwell, Executive Director of the Wyoming Community College Commission. Go ahead. And uh, Ms. Uh, Ravalli is correct. That is, in fact, a term of art. It's actually a little bit more than that. It is, a, it is under the federal compliance that the institutions must abide by. So the total cost of attendance, including the personal expenses that are uh, included in that is a pre-calculated uh, amount that uh, the institutions must provide. It's under their total cost of attendance on their websites and it is what is recorded with the US Department of Education. So it is a very specific amount, um, whether a student is on campus or a student is living off campus, they have those two uh, calculated amounts that are uh, verified and then used as the official um, um, calculation for that institution for all sources of aid. In terms of the aid going directly uh, to the students uh, via the institutions, that again happens through the financial aid offices. It is called packaging of a student in which uh, it is based on any allowable expenses within any specific uh, scholarship or grant. Uh, toward the total cost of attendance institutions are not uh, permitted to uh, provide funding that exceeds the total cost of attendance. I so hope that helps. I understand correctly what you're saying is that because of for your accreditation or whatever you have a part of that calculation means they're going to get some personal money and travel and I and I quite frankly wasn't aware of that. So tell me a typically a dollar amount that might be in there. Then I know Senator Hicks has a follow-up. Do we know an amount that a student might receive for his travel to get to school and all that that I wasn't aware of that now we are paying for? Mr. Chairman, I will gather that very quickly. I have it available. Um, so I will look that up very quickly and get that right back to you. While you're looking that up, go ahead, Senator Hicks. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sandy, just want to make sure that the language in the bill when we talk about travel and personal expenses reflects when we use the, the language of the attendance costs, that those are consistent with what the federal government does. And then I'm assuming that, that if we do that, that's applicable across whether it's junior college, University of Wyoming, that, that those federal guidelines are the same. But 
but it's the language we have for travel and personal expenses included into that federal cost of attendance. And the thing I would add also the private institutions as well. Go ahead, Sandy. Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Hicks, uh, you are correct. Those, those are not in conflict because those are uh, specific categories within the total cost of attendance. Every single uh, one of the community colleges, the university, and any accredited private institution is required by federal law to post those and make them publicly available. And they do have to report on those on an annual basis uh, regarding their compliance for uh, eligibility for federal financial aid. Thank you. Okay, I so what you're the, to go ahead, uh, Reverend Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Sandy. Could you, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little confused. I'd asked earlier uh, about who the uh, nonprofits or the private entities go through. I had understood that goes, <clears throat> and from reading the handout that you give us, that it went through the Community College Commission, but then we, we, we're, we're, we hear that it goes through workforce services. Um, I, I'm confused. Can you help me? Yeah, I think what we have is we have the Community College Commission does the community colleges, the university does the university, and the Workforce Services does the others. Is that not correct, Tamara? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. That is what this bill draft has. What we also have going on and um, competing with this is that the governor has created two programs to go ahead and similarly provide some support for post-secondary institutions and higher education students. Um, and those rules have been summarized and provided to you as handouts. So those are 57 million and a half dollars uh, have been allocated by the governor's office for that. This bill of draft is proposing a kind of competing but also similar and maybe duplicative program in some ways, but there are some distinctions. And one of that distinction is that's that the Department of Workforce Services under the bill would administer it for post-secondary. And I think under the existing program, the Community College Commission is working with those post-secondary private institutions. Well, Thank under the governor's proposed spending, does it include private institutions like the Catholic College or just strictly our four, our seven community colleges and university? So, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, Representative Larson, go ahead. So to, so to answer that, and as part of the question I have, because I, I'm just trying to make sure that uh, all the information that, that we have that I can correlate it in its right slot. We have we have a document that's provided to us called CARES Wyoming College Grant Guidance from the Community College Commission. Down at the bottom of the first page, it says any private or nonprofit Title IV-E or Title IV eligible and accredited grant granting post-secondary institution must seek eligibility through the Wyoming Community College Commission. That's what was confusing me. And so the, what I'm understanding is this is the program that the governor's released is what is that and under this bill those private entities would go through workforce services correct i That's see people correct. nodding their heads go ahead tamara yes mr chairman okay so the answer to the yes question is under the governor's authority it would go through workforce services or community college commission which is it Mr. Chairman, the Community College Commission would administer that for the private and nonprofit post-secondary qualifying institutions under the governor's program. Okay, we got that clarified. All right, Senator Hicks, do you have anything else for Sandy while we got her? Okay, thank you, Sandy. We may hear from you later at public comments. We take public comments. Okay, Tamara, let's continue. I think we're on the bottom of page 14. We specify what payments shall only be provided to eligible students. So those are the payments upon application from the three administering entities. And that students who have been accepted by and are enrolled in an eligible institution for the 2020 through 2021 academic year and have demonstrated their citizenship or permanent resident status and who comply with subsection C. Let's stop right there. So, you know, a lot of these could be uh, enrolled and accepted like the last day, like uh, Representative Larson's talked about. Is there any way to gather information from pre-enrollment 
and then be able to ascertain that that pre-enrollment is down and therefore that would be that incremental group. Is that, I'm just trying to figure out a way to, to capture the, the appropriate group. Would that be something that might work? Mr. Co-Chair? Go ahead, Bob. Oh, well, and part of the problem, because I, I, I kind of see the, what, you're, what you're directing at, but my understanding is, because we've had some discussions, uh, we had it with the Community College Funding Committee um, last week, when public notice went out from the governor that there was additional funds for, for possible tuition um, a week ago or 10 days ago, and because of the college tomorrow uh, the, um, component of it, um, my understanding is over the course of the last week or two, enrollments in community colleges and UW have, have spiked significantly. Um, to the uh, and it was kind of amazing that how it just happened. And so the um, so the effect of this has already gone into, into practice for at least five or ten percent of the of the remaining enrollments. Um, and so I don't know how you can do a cutoff line or when you do it. Um, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be a problem because it's they, they went from you know they were we were told 20 to 30 percent down three weeks ago. Last week we were told that it's uh, more in the teens uh, now. And UW in fact had spiked up um, to the point where they're only three four hundred short from their prior um, enrollment. Um, because of the recent spike in the last week or two. Yeah, good point. And maybe that's the way we analyze it because that spike occurred because now people realize that it's, it's available to help them out, these students do. And, <clears throat> and maybe the way to handle it, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, is on the other end of it to be sure that that money actually goes to those students through the way we do it through the institution, not to just give the university more money in their block grant or how that might happen. Go ahead, Reverend Summer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I think you guys are hitting on all the reasons why Wyoming tomorrow kind of did what we did. I think that you have, you know, you have a policy decision. You can, you can pay a, a bit for everybody, which is what this does, or you can means test and pay. Um, but it's really hard to find that incremental difference. I, I think that's the challenge. You can look at the students that need it the most, or you can kind of look at all students. Um, the committee landed on all students just because of, particularly because of the family support that this would buy during what is a really tough time. And of course, the issue there, if you do all students, it only happens for at least right now, one semester. And then where do you do with those students and all that age of second semester when there's no more COVID money? And, and I don't think any of us can answer that one. Okay, Tamara, go ahead. Well, maybe Bob can answer that one. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. No, no, I, I just had a separate question, Mr. Co-Chair. And because what I what I don't see is a is a definition of secondary education. Because when you go back and, and you look at the, um, the workforce services training provider list, it goes on um, for four or five pages. And my question is, was it the tomorrow's committee anticipating that this would be available to all of those um, types of post high school um, certificated classes for cosmology, for truck driving, for those type of things. Um, and did they look at those costs or, and how to add, what, what was the, what's the intent of the bill as drafted? Cause I'm just curious. And then, then for example, with, with the Catholic college, they have a fairly sophisticated um, enrollment policy and a um, scholarship policy. I know that with um, WyoTech, they they have an even more sophisticated program where they you know they go out and they bring in students from all over the um, the United States and they have package deals with all types of federal funding grants, um, uh, Pell grants tied into it so that it, it's kind of a package deal when they roll in. And I'm just curious if, if any of those issues were kind of discussed by the Wyoming Tomorrow's group or how they were gonna, how they segregate secondary education 
versus the training courses and the job course and the private entities. And then finally, um, this includes um, post-grad classes as well. So is it law students? Is it master's thesis students? Is it doctorate students? Well, I'll be glad to let Representative Summers answer that. I thought it was primarily for the, for the, for, you know, the, not for the post-secondary doctorate programs, but go ahead, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to speak to the last one, but I think the first one, you raise a good point. And I mean, we were, how we limited it in Wyoming tomorrow is we limited the money. So we limited the money for those um, in, in the, the non, uh, non-college, non-university, the private entities. We limited the money, and I can't remember how much now, and Tamara can probably, I don't know if it's in this bill, or but certainly was in the other bill. And so the idea is we just limited the money and probably be a first come, first serve on what money we had. Um, I don't think we in the Wyoming Tomorrows had any idea of the extensive list of private entities out there. Um, I think what we wanted to do is give some opportunity to uh, to those private entities and and certainly those certificate programs that are very important in Wyoming. And so uh, that that's my recollection. Tamara, what did we limit that dollar figure to? Mr. Chairman, Representative Summers, that's limited to 4,200. And the only reference to what type of institution we're talking about here is on page 12, lines two and three, an accredited private post-secondary educational institution. And so the department, when they administer the program, they promulgate rules necessary, would need to determine what meets that criteria. But for example, the bill does not use the same definition that the Community College Commission would use related to federal title for eligibility for credit certificate or degree programs that it might be one and the same. And I'm not sure if every entity on the Department of Workforce Services list meets either criteria. Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow up. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you look on page 19, and it is in there, um, we limited it to $5 million for um, the Department of Workforce Services. So that was that was the uh, throttle on that piece was to just throttle the money. Okay, any other questions, committee? Okay, I believe we're on, still on page 14. Go ahead, Tamara. I think I've gone through on um, page 14, leading on to page 15, uh, those criteria that students be enrolled um, demonstrate their status as a citizen or permanent resident and then comply with subsection C. And subsection C defines the specific asks of the student. The first is that they certify an application, uh, that they are an eligible student. An eligible student is as defined and includes enrolled for the full year that they uh, certify to the department that they will perform COVID-19 safety procedures and will consistently perform those procedures during the 2020-2021 academic year. That's really, there's no other criteria for need or demonstrated um, impact from COVID-19. It's that they will perform these safety measures. Okay, hold off, Senator Hicks, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Tamara, so if we go up to subsection B there, can, can, can you explain to me what it says, where it says demonstrated United States citizenship or status as a permanent resident alien who meets the definition of an eligible non-citizen? It seems like an awful lot of language uh, that we could probably simplify. So what what is a... a uh, permanent resident alien, but they're eligible non-citizen. Who, who are we talking about? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, the more extensive definition of that comes in on page 12, lines six through 11. And it's a immigrant who meets the definition of an eligible non-citizen under Title IV of the Federal Higher Education Act of 1965, or a substantially similar act. 
And this terminology comes from the Hathaway program in our Wyoming statutes and the Wyoming Works program in our Wyoming statutes. And it's those citizens who are non-citizens, aliens who come over to the United States and are granted permanent resident status. And the federal law is pretty complex and um, certain eligible refugees from certain countries and um, certain green card holders. And it's those uh, aliens who are eligible for other federal aid. And remember this is COVID-19 federal money that's being appropriated here. There was some concern, I think that um, those aliens who are now permanent residents are um, afforded opportunities and laws of the United States in general for federal funding. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, and maybe somebody uh, can uh, on the Wyoming's tomorrow, but, but this is federal funding, but it was allocated to the state of Wyoming. It's not just general federal monies that are doled out. So if I could get some little clarification and discussion um, where this was specifically allocated to the state of Wyoming, um, why are we allocating money now to foreign nationals that have permanent alien green status or even people from non-residents that don't reside within the state of Wyoming with the limited funds that we have? So maybe Albert could uh, jump in and give me a little uh, background on that. I'd appreciate it. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And you know, I'm not going to say my my own preference during the mar during that Wyoming tomorrow's discussion, but I will tell you what the committee as a whole felt that we wanted. We there were other states that were providing incentive programs in their universities and colleges, similar to what this was, to try to get more um, more people in their colleges and universities to try to stop that leakage of uh, or that basically leakage of students away from the institutions. And so I think it was felt by a majority of the members um, on that task force that it, Wyoming wanted to be competitive with other states and other universities and colleges. And so by that, by that standard, we would try to attract those, those students from uh, wherever we could attract them from. Um, you know, I think the language on the on the alien piece was put in there just as Tamara said, because it was consistent with programs we already have in the state of Wyoming, Wyoming Tomorrow and the Hathaway. Um, but I think that uh, that was the discussion that took place, um, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Hicks. Turn your mic on. Uh, Representative Summers, and, and I understand if that we were competing, if all the universities were doing this, but do we do we have an idea? Was it was it a handful? Were they state funded institutions? Were they private institutions? Um, you know, are, are we competing with MIT and, and, and Cal Berkeley or is this CSU and North Dakota State? Because I think that makes a big difference as whether they're private or, or, or public institutions, and then the number. If it's just a handful, do we have any demographics on the number of colleges and, and what type of colleges are doing that? Go ahead, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'm, I'm kind of working on vapors here on my recollection, but what I remember was the Colorado case. And it was my understanding, this is my memory, so I could be wrong on this, that Colorado had had out of the CARES Act had allocated appropriated over 400 million to their post-secondary folks, um, some of which was to be used for um, scholarship programs to incentivize uh, enrollment. That's my understanding. That's what I th think I remember hearing. So it was really that neighbor next door that we were hearing this about and and sandy or somebody else might have a better rem, rem memory of that than i you know um chairman be about you might ask sandy if she remembers any of those figures yeah and we will if sandy gets ready to answer that she can get prepared go ahead reverend larson 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tamara or maybe Albert, somebody on the committee on page 16, where we talk about the payment under this section shall be, and then in two, it says, it has to be conditioned upon the applicant certifying that the student consistently performs COVID safety procedures. And as I read that, that means here during the course of the summer, I have to certify that I consistently perform COVID safety procedures. And I don't know why my, why that, I that would be a condition of me receiving those, those dollars. I can understand it being during the course of the, am I reading that wrong? Yeah, we're jumping around here, but uh, if Representative Summers can answer that, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. One of the conditions is to try to make it as, as consistent with um, the, the CARES Act language as we could. The idea, and, and maybe it's not, I believe the idea behind the amendment, and maybe it's not in here completely correct, but we want, and, and I, I agree, I don't think it's quite like we brought it out in Wyoming's Tomorrow. We wanted them to follow whatever institutions um, COVID um, guidelines that there were. So UW has COVID guidelines. If you're gonna remain eligible for this scholarship as a UW student, you would have to follow UW's COVID guidelines. Same with uh, Casper College or, or Western. So that was the intent. I, I would agree. Um, you know, I'm not sure that, I don't know if the verbiage is quite right, but Tamara, is that consistent with the verbiage, what I just said or not? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Representative Summers, that uh, is a defined term back a few pages ago, the COVID-19 safety procedures that relates to the procedures of each institution. And it's uh, consistently performed them during the 2020-2021 academic year. Okay, and I would agree with that. Sandy, what I wanna do is to answer representative's question when you make your public comments, maybe you could address it at that time. Tamara, I have a question. Under the way the money is allocated from the feds and these are federal dollars, are there certain provisions we have to honor relative to like green cards because it's federal dollars that uh, if it was our state, we might say yay or nay? Are there limitations there we gotta be, we gotta be careful of and be sure we follow? Mr. Chairman, there are legal concerns about that, that there are requirements on federal grants and programs and benefits that might be applicable because these are federal dollars that are being passed out by the state. But the issue really is very complex. It's a matter of immigration law and it's a little unclear what kind of benefit program this is. It's a payment to students for going to school and it's an educational benefit, but it's also for complying with safety procedures. And so it's not exactly clear to me. It is pretty complex. Uh, I think that the, I wanna be very clear that the tomorrow's task force was clear that they did not want this funding to go to international students that was decided and voted on. The permanent resident issue came up and was approved by the chairman of that task force in, um, moving this bill on to this committee. And so this permanent resident status wasn't a great deal of debate, although things like international students who are different category and would not be included in this generally, or illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants would not be included. The advice of LSO I think was to look to our other programs and be consistent with them, but it is really a much larger question and it could if we excluded permanent residents, it might open the um, program up to a challenge, but I'm not sure that the outcome uh, of that challenge. I appreciate that. And that would be my understanding as well. But one of the, the issues we got to think about as we set public policy as a state, you know, if we only have limited funds, is uh, are we violating anything if we say we shall utilize existing funds for, in, you know, for this certain group first, Rather than, you know, I mean, if I'd hate to see us take away a kid from Manderson or Shoshone wanting to go to one of our institutions, but can't because that money goes to someone with a green card. Go ahead and I see if you can answer that. Mr. Chairman, they would all be on equal footing for application under this, uh, the way the bill's drafted. So the question is if we gave preference to uh, legitimate in-state 
well, or, you know, national, you know, citizens, does that create some conflicts? And I know the answer, it sure might. Okay, any other questions, committee? Proceed. I think we are on uh, to page 16, and, and we answered part of that, but yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Go ahead. Leading off of page 16, there is a staff comment, and I'll just comment on this. We this goes back to the conversation on the last section, discuss that the guidance is based on costs incurred during this covered period that right now ends December 30th. And we use the terminology of the academic year. So we're envisioning the fall and there being some compliance necessary in the fall, although the money is all going out during the fall semester, there's still some performance that re is required in the spring semester. And so if you think of this program as a contract with students to perform their COVID-19 safety protocols and procedures, then the CARES Act guidance might say that that delivery of performance needs to be done during the covered period. And so that could be a change that the committee wants to consider for consistency with the CARES Act guidance. But I think the Tomorrow's Task Force in general debated this issue and delivered it. And this is the language that was passed on for this bill. So I won't go on any more about that point. Senator Hicks. Turn your mic on, Larry. Mr. Chairman, just a, another question on that section. It, it just seems to me, and I understand that we got to put something on there that they're in compliance but there's no provisions for enforcement or anything else. So it looks to me like we're just creating a lot of bureaucratic process here, that there's no penalties if you don't follow it. There's no enforcement if you don't follow it. We're just putting stuff in here saying that you have to follow uh, and certify that you follow Corvid. But, but what happens if we found out that somebody actually didn't? What are we gonna do? Take the money away? I just always worry when we start putting a lot of information and stuff in there that really doesn't do anything. But it's more of a comment than a question, but, but was there any discussion? What would be the penalty, uh, Tamara? Or was if somebody was certified that they were gonna follow it and then they didn't follow the uh, safety protocols? What's the, what's the net effect of that? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Senator Hicks, there's no clawback provision or penalty provision in the text of this language. There may be something that could be implemented by rule, I believe. Um, but I, I don't think that the Tomorrow's Task Force envisioned a, um, a look back in particular. Okay, continue. All right. The, Section paragraph three on page 16 states that the grant shall only be made with that 1.25 billion that was provided to the state and no funds from any other source should be used for this grant or payment program, but nothing in the paragraph prohibits um, the institution from awarding other scholarships to a student. On page 17. Well, before we leave that, we had some discussion early on about you know, the fact that already federal dollars have gone out and we may offset. If we were to consider something like that, would this be the place where we would talk about it, Tamara? Mr. Chairman, I think that you could implement that in this section or the prior section where it talks about it being the uh, last dollars in, or maybe both together might need to be looked at depending on your policy. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Kochar brought that up. All right, let's proceed. Right on page 17, the student needs to make application for payment not later than the institution's final course drop date for the 2020 fall semester. And the let's rules- right there. On the colleges, I think they've already, the community colleges have already done that. So what is, uh, does this language prohibit anything since the drop date's already occurred? And this, this may not become to take effect until a special session. Is there any conflicting language there or possibilities that we need to consider? Mr. Chairman, I think that if this act is effective later than the course drop dates, we'll need to make it clear that it's the later of the date of the, you know, the bill 
or the institution's final course drop date. Okay. The entities are asked to promulgate rules within 20 days to administer the program after enactment of the law. And the funds must be expended in accordance with state and federal law regulations and orders. And then finally, uh, reporting is required as is necessary to satisfy the federal reporting requirements that are on the state. And then the program is going to terminate on the last day of the covered period. Mr. Co-Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. I'm curious about the rules. If, if you look at page 15, Romanet I at the bottom, it says the application shall be developed by the department, the commission, and the university jointly. That suggests there's just one application. Um, and the I, it seems to me that that administratively is probably not e efficient and maybe not even realistic because their, their applications are going to be different um, and, and probably address different things. So I'm just curious if that there was a discussion of that, why the word jointly is there or if, if jointly is needed, if, if they would own, each one would develop their own application. Uh, and and particularly if you're talking about, well, for example, the um, Wyotech, their classes started back in June. And so, um, you know, they've been in session and, and they're probably gonna start a new semester coming up here um, in October, or I forget, but, you know, cause they're sequenced, I think over like four different um, components over the year. Uh, so I, I just wonder if that has been discussed. Anybody answer that question? Uh, there being no, none to volunteer. I don't recall when we had our meeting that we talked about it either, Mr. Co-Chair. But when I saw that same language and, and when I looked at it today, I, I don't know how you can jointly do rules with three different entities. It seems to me you probably should have one that does the rulemaking and, and comes with the rules rather than having three other than you could seek their input, but certainly there has to be one that has a final decision. And I think, is that the point you're getting to? Yes, or that they have, they have to create their own rules through emergency regs. I can't see how you can make regs for somebody else. Um, I, that doesn't make sense. Okay, good points. Let's continue. We are on now to page 18. This is a new provision that was kind of developed by the work. The idea was developed by the work group. It wasn't part of the tomorrow's task force language. This is subsection J and it provides that if there are any funds um, provided that are appropriated in this section remain after the payments are made to students for each of the three eligible institutions or administrating entities then the excess funds may be expended on costs incurred during the covered period to facilitate compliance with COVID-19 related health measures at each of the eligible institutions. So just if there are other measures that are needed to um, help create a safe environment for the students or respond to the public health emergency, those funds can, excess funds can be used for that after all payments are made to the students. Well, and so how do you determine who gets what and how they would do that? That would be probably taken care of in the rules. Would that be correct, Tamara? Mr. Chairman, I think that each, in, each entity in general is provided a chunk of money. And so UW's funds could be used at UW. Department of Workforce Services could be used at the eligible institutions, those private, those secondary institutions and CC funds could be used at any of the seven. So it would be up to the Community College Commission, for example, to determine how to allocate funds between their seven community colleges. Yeah, but in reality, what would happen is the money would go out if there's money left over, that would happen. The legislature then would have nothing. They would not be involved in the loop of it to, to have any say on it. That would be correct, right? Mr. Chairman, I think so. If the university, for example, determined that um, very few students to payment were uh, 
needed after all the other financial aid was accounted for, they would be left to determine how to spend that money as long as it was in compliance with COVID-19 related health measures at that institution. Okay, and uh, who's ever handling the uh, this JAC meeting who gets on board, please let Senator Anderson join us. He's not able to get on, has not been accepted. So let's let him in. Okay, let's continue. Mr. Chairman, then we have the appropriation. Again, we're reappropriating that 1.25 billion from the amounts that are authorized and made available for expenditure to the governor. We're reappropriating, and we had this discussion earlier, it's not necessarily subject to the availability of funding, but it could be. Uh, first to the Community College Commission, $50 million second to the University of Wyoming, $66 million, and third, Department of Workforce Services, $5 million. On page 19. Hold on a second, hold, hold on a second right there. Let's talk about that, those amounts of money. These are different than the, uh, is it, are they different than the Wyoming Tomorrow numbers? I know they're different than the governor's. Albert, do you remember some of the discussion we had on this that we could share with the committee? So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, I'm not going to remember the exact math that went into this, but this was more or less that number multiplied by a set of students that they felt would be eligible for this. Then that was the the money that came up. Um, Tamara, is that kind of your recollection of what happened? Uh, maybe Dawn, somebody might have that, but that was my recollection. Uh, Tamara, you remember, I I know that there was some discussion about uh, different amounts of money and ultimately we came up with these numbers and it might have been justification in some kind of a report submitted to us. Help us out. Mr. Chairman, yes. So I think that you were provided some background on where those numbers came from through a memo from LSO's um, Fiscal Division, Don Richards and Elizabeth Martineau that back um, track some of that math. The numbers are from the Tomorrow's Task Force and they are, you are correct, they are an estimate of the um, prior year's number of students and costs. And then Tomorrow's Task Force added $5 million to the Department of Workforce Services. So that was included. And these numbers are different from the governor's numbers for the two programs he created. That was 57 and a half, uh, 57.5 million total for the program for his programs and your programs in this bill draft or more than that. Don, if you're still on the line, could you share that uh, the rationale, how we came up with 50 and 66, if you would, please? Don, you there? Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Tamara is accurate. Uh, we developed the numbers for the state institutions based on enrollment counts from the prior year, multiplied by their uh, um, housing uh, costs and fees. We did not take into account uh, tuition or personal or travel expenses when we created this. We looked at the room and board rather. Um, I would mention that the university's number included a 20% reduction because at the time that was their estimated um, total enrollment. The, the community colleges uh, included about the full uh, enrollment from last year. And I would also mention that the university has modified its uh, room and board rates, not only when we prepared uh, those original estimates, but in the last week or so, when they delayed their start date to the end of September, I understand that they will also be modifying, further modifying their room and board. Uh, as to the workforce services number, as mentioned previously by Representative Summers, that number was not calculated, but rather was implemented as a cap on the total amount you, uh, that was eligible. Yeah, the other thing too, Don, is you know, you got room and board and then tuition. Wasn't there an interpretation that tuition might be ongoing costs or, or not that, but it would be, would be supplementing previous costs. And so we might not be able to get that money under the COVID program, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. The Wyoming's Tomorrow Task Force initially uh, started this program, as I understand it, with a tuition and fee reimbursement for academic purposes. Uh, when the governor was contemplating uh, his own program, the attorney general um, has at least informally opined that uh, tuition and academic fees 
uh, were not appropriate for COVID dollars. And that's why we've shifted uh, both in this bill and with the governor's program to more of a housing and uh, um, cost of attendance approach. Okay, thank you for that, Don. Anybody have any, go ahead, Senator Guru. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that 5 million for workforce services, I wanna make sure I got that. That's for all the other institutions that are on the list that was in the, in the, in the handout that we got from workforce services, but it's administered through the Community College Commission. Do I have that right or am I, is that a different? No, I got it wrong. I can see Don, Don's after me. Don, me out. go ahead, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the governor's program, those private institutions are being administered through the Wyoming Community College Commission. In the legislative program, they're being administered through the Department of Workforce Services. The Wyoming's Tomorrow Task Force was not privy to the six page handout from the Workforce Services, but I believe during their discussion, they mentioned four primary institutions, the auto, um, uh, the well-known okay. training school in Casper in Laramie, a cosmetology school in Cheyenne and a private uh, higher education institution in the center of the state. Well, and I think what this bill does and in, in that all inclusive list, it, it says no more than 5 million. I think we all get that. Any other questions of Don? Okay, let's continue. So the standard language on that we're using for appropriations in this bill is on page 19, subsection M, uh, directing where the appropriation comes from. The sweep date for this as it came from the Tomorrow's Task Force was November 30th, 2020. And so perhaps with this new subsection J that funds could be, excess funds could be expended by the institutions for other measures, maybe there won't be remaining amounts, but in the event that there are um, overestimates that are needed for the payments to students or the other health measures, then that sweep would occur on November 30th and go back to the governor to be expended for the other purposes allowed in the special session legislation. And I think that concludes the uh, tomorrow's task force higher education support provision. Okay, Don, you got a comment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to interject at this break right before uh, section three, a number of uh, Senate chairmen have joined the meeting, Senator Coe, Senator Anderson, Senator Landon, potentially some others. They were initially uh, scheduled to be on the agenda at uh, 1130 to 1145. We are running a bit behind. I just wanted to acknowledge their attendance and if the chairs wanted to reschedule them at a later time after lunch, just so they are, are aware of when they might be um, asked back. Yeah, I didn't realize we had a specific time slot for our very important committee chairman. We can do, uh, we can listen to them now. It'd probably be more appropriate if we got through this bill and heard from them this afternoon. I can only see Senator Coe on the line. Senator Coe, would it be all right with you if we rescheduled you and the other committee chair at a later, later date this afternoon? Would that work? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Okay, seeing his thumb pointed in the affirmative direction, let's go ahead and do that, Don. And we'd, we welcome you all to stay on if you're so inclined, but let's uh, schedule another time and be sure and let, let me know when that is so we can get them in there. I hate to see them. They're busy people and I want to be sure and afford them their appropriate time. Okay, Tamara, go ahead. We're now on section three. Section three provides CARES Act funding for uh, two things, telemedicine carts in school districts and wireless internet access points at outdoor school districts. We have definitions uh, similar to the ones that came before of CARES Act and covered period. Then a new definition on page 21 of department to mean the Department of Enterprise Technology Services. Even though these uh, this technology is for school districts. The working group asked that the Department of Enterprise Technology Services, ETS, be the entity to receive the funding and try to coordinate it. Telemedicine is defined and it means a mode of delivery of healthcare services provided through telecommunications to facilitate the assessment, diagnosis, consultation, treatment, education, and care management for a patient while the healthcare provider is located at a different site from the patient. Telemedicine cart is defined to be a system of integrated audio visual software displays and network asset access that facilitates the delivery of telemedicine. 
the program is created through the appropriation. It's fairly simple appropriation, not a complex program. In subsection B on page 21, we reappropriate to the Department of ETS from that 1.25 billion. We reappropriate $5 million on page 22 for the acquisition and installation of telemedicine cards in school district facilities to facilitate the delivery of telemedicine to ensure that necessary healthcare services are accessible to students um, during the public health emergency caused by COVID-19. $5 million is probably not enough to provide, is not enough to provide a telemedicine cart in every school district if everyone should want one and they might not all be equipped, um, from what I understand, to handle them, but they'd be allocated on a first come first serve basis upon submission of application by the school district to the director or chief information officer of ETS on or before October 15th. And the department would coordinate the acquisition and installation of the telemedicine cards in school district facilities to ensure that these things are installed before the end of the covered period. The second appropriation, um, let me comment that we uh, received some estimates that they each cart could cost up to $30,000, but maybe there are more reasonable ones that would be half that. I think it's a little bit unknown right now. The second appropriation is 1.3 million, which was a figure that was um, helped estimated by the Department of Enterprise Technology Services for outdoor internet, internet access wireless points. And that's for acquisition and installation of the hardware and equipment and software to um, install and provide these wireless internet access points at uh, the principal school district facilities, which there are 318 schools. That's not counting school districts, but some of them are combined and share a facility. So the principal 318 schools would each receive a outdoor wireless internet access point under this appropriation. And the internet access point would need to be used to facilitate compliance with COVID-19 related health measures, including distance learning and telework and telemedicine for students, families, and the communities. Uh, then lastly, these should be installed by the last day of the covered period. So those are the two appropriations in two ETS, four school districts. Hold on, Tamara, go ahead, Reverend Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And and uh, you all got a, I don't know if my, yeah, I'm on. Okay, you, Mr. Chairman, you you all received an amendment. So I just wanted to speak a little bit here. We we run the risk if we, on our E-rate, so we get some federal dollars, E-rate dollars um, for broadband schools do. And um, th there is some requirements there. There's some requirements that have changed sort of during the COVID period. I think Tamara, at the time we look at that amendment, we'll go into it. We don't wanna jeopardize our E-rate dollars. So we wanna make sure that if we purchase these and use these, we are compliant with the federal regulations so we don't uh, lose those dollars. And so that's, and, and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you, you and I talked about that at, the, at our committee meeting. We really didn't have the language um, but Tamara brought that language up. That is correct. Thank you, Representative Summers. Senator Hicks, your mic is on. Do you have a question? Okay. Let's go ahead and proceed, Tamara. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I do want to let you all know here that ETS did ask to meet with LSO staff, myself and Mr. Richards, and we did discuss these provisions and um, got their input. We didn't incorporate it, any of that into the bill draft itself. I think they have had some questions about the partnership and cooperation with the school districts and how some of the logistics would work. And so um, I will leave them to make any comments that they want if um, they end up being able to attend this meeting. But just to let you know, we did have that meeting and discuss it with them. Uh, the final part of this section is the appropriation. The, um, those conditions include the standard language that we're using in the rest of this bill and have that sweep, sweep date set back to the governor's office on October 15th. And that's highlighted in case that doesn't end up making sense with the real realities of how much time is needed for this program. 
That's section three. I think we can move on to section four if there's no questions. Before we do, committee, <clears throat> any comments or questions? Okay, section four. Section four is the last mile broadband reservation in the event that federal funds that do not recruit any agency, so those federal funds that come directly to the state and the state has discretion with them, if they're provided to the state for COVID-19 related purposes on or after the effective date of this act, so future federal funds if new funds come in and they come in before during this biennium, before June 30th, 2022, then $80 million is reserved uh, to only be expended upon further legislative action. So another bill that will be passed uh, for last mile infrastructure to provide broadband internet services to end users and end users devices to facilitate compliance with COVID-19 related public health measures. Okay. And finally, we have the effective date and that's the bill. Okay, any questions on the, the last mile? Uh, I have a question for, for Tamara, maybe Don. I know that the SLIB entertained a bunch of applications for, for some uh, broadband and, and fiber installation around the state. Was that last mile or, and, and there's, there's a substantial amount of money I think that, that they did approve. Do we know what kind of applications they were, what they were for? Is this conflicting with this? Is this in addition to? I do know that, it, and, I, and I look at my county, maybe someone else could, could interject on their counties, but there's a question whether or not this really goes to, to the uh, installation of that last mile or maybe to, to a certain few select entities that may be spending the money on other things. Anybody have any idea on what's going on with what the SLIB did or how this interfaces with section four of our bill? Okay, well, Albert, you do, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I saw Don Richard short arm it, and I'm smart enough to know that I'd let rather Don go first than make a fool out of me later. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd rather I'd let I'd, uh, I'd allow I'd let uh, Don go first if he if he would if he knows. Hey, Don, I don't have you on my screen. I'm sorry. Jump in, uh, Mr. Chairman. You're exactly right. Uh, the executive branch did allocate 86 million dollars in broadband grants. This uh, $80 million would be in addition to those uh, projects that were uh, previously approved. Uh, I don't think you can um, characterize the approvals uh, that have been made as necessarily last mile. There may be some examples of that, but there were also some uh, cell tower uh, Wi-Fi installation. So it depended on the specific application. It wasn't solely last mile. Well, and then the reality of it is if they've approved it, we appropriated the money in the special session, uh, that money's out the door and, and for whatever they decided to spend it on, it will be spent that way. You're nodding your head. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Turn your mic on. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, so Mr. Chairman, it's, uh, if you go to the, the business council site, you can you can find out where all that money went. By and large, it's last mile, except there's a pretty good chunk of fiber running up that eastern corridor along that highway where we have had no fiber, which is a really good thing because that will get to the last mile eventually. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I was purview to, uh, you know, I saw the original list and amount of applications. And suffice it to say, it far exceeded that 86 million. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna divest how much because I'm not sure I was supposed to, but uh, suffice it to say it was a lot more. And, and so what this money would do is set some money aside. If we get an extension date from um, the federal government or, or perhaps other dollars later on in another bill, we have appropriated money that would allow last mile broadband. And I, I can't stress the importance enough of, of getting more broadband further out into the state. Even it's even like the co-chair says, it's not even further out into the state. Sometimes it's just to the edge of the town or the edge of the city. And, uh, and this is something we have to do if we intend to 
uh, move ourselves forward. Well, I appreciate those comments and what, what seems to happen. We talk about the last mile and then in reality where the money gets spent, the last mile doesn't get spent. And I guess if each of our individual areas or districts were to have concerns, they should go look at that 86 million. And if in fact there's last mile that doesn't exist there, this would be the purpose of what we're talking about doing here to supplant that. So, okay. Did that take us through the bill, Tamara? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I do think I want to comment real quick that there is some risk in how you uh, how we've drafted this and put it in there. It, it's upon further legislative appropriation, so um, that could make it challenging for timing uh, if the legislature is not able to act when this future future money gets appropriated. Um, so just for your knowledge, we'll have to address that in a future bill if it ends up being in conflict in some way. Well, obviously, if we don't have a, a special session to deal with this, then when the, the JAC meets in December, whatever it is, to look at legislation, they will take this and do with what they see fit. And the whole a lot of things will have changed by then. Go ahead, Representative Summers. I see your hand up. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and uh, just quickly, Tamara, I don't recall upon further legislative action being something that the co-chair and I talked about, but then I'm, my mind doesn't always remember everything. So why is that in here? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's a great point. That is just drafting um, liberty that was taken. The direction was to make sure we reserve funds. And so uh, in taking that direction, I use language that we sometimes use in other bills to say upon further legislative action, because it's hard for the legislature to appropriate funds that don't exist yet and to account for all of the contingencies, it would be ideally perfect if the legislature could come back in and further define how to, what last mile broadband means and how to allocate that money. But if that risk of um, the legislature not being able to come in back into session, if that funding were to come in in the middle of next interim, you might wanna consider whether that should be removed. Okay, appreciate that. That completes the uh, LSO presentation of our bill. Uh, generally, does anyone have, on the committee have any, we're not gonna work the bill right now and I don't want a motion, we're gonna take some public testimony first, but does anyone have any thoughts right now as we've gone through the bill, any last minute questions? Okay, there being none, help me out. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, so just to, I think it'd be useful to have kind of the 20,000 foot level explanation of as we work through this bill and get public comment, if, if we already appropriated 86 million and how that lines up, what is transpiring here and what, I mean, and what communication had, did the committee have with the governor and with public comment on the issues that of, of what we're trying to do. Curious to know what was presented to the working group. Um, I'm curious how they came up with the dollar amounts and what the basis was for the dollar amounts, both for the smaller amounts and for the 80 million. Um, and on that section four, to me, the way that's worded is that um, I think because it goes out to June 20, 30, 2022, what they're saying is it, the way I read it is, if it if there's an extensions of COVID dollars past the up through the session in January, then they'll be able to take care of it one way or the other, or even during the next biennium. So, um, so that that so sounds to me like there was kind of a different component to that, and I'm not sure how you reserve dollars when we know that 1.25 billion has already been allocated by the governor's office. Are we re, how do we reserve all, dollars that have already been allocated, and so and so how do these kind of overlap, and and when we're as we're moving forward through this? Yeah, and I think that a lot of this came from that broadband select committee or commission, right, Representative Summers, and I believe you're on that. So if you'd like to jump in, please do. So, Mr. Chairman, I think at the time we didn't know how much had been allocated by the governor for sure on any of these and where there's still some 
there's still, uh, you know, there's, there's stuff that may be set aside in buckets, but I'm not sure they're spent. Um, the 80 million, I can tell you at the time, the governor's office was talking about uh, around 100 million for, for broadband. They ended up funding 86. So I had, uh, I had heard that there was uh, roughly 180 million in applications. So the 80 million just comes from the difference. Um, this language, you know, I, I assumed it would be from leftover CARES Act and or other legislation that may come, come to pass, federal legislation that may come to pass. Um, I think any of this stuff we were looking at, you know, is there an over allocation? I think we have a, I think Don's gonna go over that at some point here. Um, but I think this was uh, all of these pieces of this bill just represent uh, legislative initiatives. And that's about all I can say for it. Okay. Uh, to someone else out there, Tamara? Cameron, I, I understood the direction to be, and I, I could have absolutely gotten this wrong, but to be for new federal funds and so included language that says if funds are provided beginning on the effective date of this act and ending June 30th, 2020. So um, funds in excess of the 1.25 billion if new federal funds are provided. And so we do wanna change that language if it should have captured uh, remaining excessive funds from the 1.25 billion. Okay, where are we on our schedule, Don, uh, in terms of the agenda? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you're about, uh, I would say an hour and 30 minutes behind. It'll take, you're 30 minutes behind the schedule right now. And I suspect you still have an hour left to take public comment on this bill as well as work the bill if that's the committee's desire. So what you're saying, we're operating on our, our standard operating procedures. And that is that is we're behind and we have an aggressive schedule. So committee, uh, what we could take some public comments now on this bill, or we could we could uh, adjourn, we could recess for a, a lunch. Uh, anybody have any preference? They they got commitments, whatever. Why don't we do this? And uh, let's everybody that wants to make public comment consider what they want to say, and and we'll ask them, and I'll ask them one more time to be as uh, you know as concise as they can be. And I don't want to limit them to what a time period, but I want to have brief comments as brief as possible. I may very well uh, interrupt them and say, we've probably heard the same thing two or three times. We don't need it again. So what we'll do is it's about 12, 10. Let's, uh, let's stand in recess until 1 p.m. And the first thing we'll do, we'll take public comments on the, the uh, COVID bill we just heard. And then if it's a committee wants to work this bill, that'll be an appropriate time. Anybody have any trouble with that? Mr. Co-Chair, you all right with that? Okay, we're in recess until 1 p.m. Thanks, everybody.